James O'Keefe has given a speech to, uh, I guess, I don't, I, I guess, the staff at, at uh, the Veritas offices confirming that he was removed from the CEO and from the board. He entered into the office and removed his personal belongings. That's what the, the, the reports are saying. And Project Veritas has released a statement accusing him of what appears to be financial malfeasance, which I, I do not believe for a moment. And one of the things they complained about, Project Veritas, the board, I guess, accusing James, was that he used money for like funny dance videos or events or something like this. And they called it like him misappropriating funds. Well, I'll, I'll, I want to make sure I'm using this, the, the, careful, uh, the specific words they use, but I'll just put it this way. I like that Project Veritas does dance events. I like that James O'Keefe is this figure, is this character that, that brings life and, and, and a, a bit of levity to the, to the work they do. And apparently that's not good enough for the board. So for this reason, they've removed him and are now, I believe, lying about what's going on. Look, man, uh, James O'Keefe is the, is the founder and CEO of Project Veritas. He's done tremendous work. The idea that Veritas can exist without him is, is laughable. And so we're, we're going to get into this. There's a lot to go through. Apparently on Twitter, they've already lost around 140,000 followers. People are just ditching, saying no way. Several major uh, 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 media figures have come out saying, I'm not going to support Project Veritas. So we'll talk about that. Plus, we got a, a, some other interesting stories. Marjorie Taylor Greene has officially called for a national divorce. Okay. I mean, there's an interesting conversation to be had, That one that we've had quite a bit. But, uh, you know, uh, you guys ready to drink Civil War? I guess. I, I don't know how you get a member of Congress saying national divorce. This idea is expanding, okay? And, and more and more people are talking about it. And I know people think that a, a national divorce is some kind of peaceful thing, but I don't see how it can go any other way than civil war. But hey, maybe it won't be civil war because the other thing we talk about a lot is World War III. Zelensky says that if China and Russia team up, it's World War III. Meanwhile, like, I don't know, everybody else is already saying, yo, it, it already started. 50 to 100 years from now, when we're all living in rubble and, and, and nuclear wasteland, we'll be like, it all started with the Ukraine and then Russia. No one's going to be waiting until Russia team, teams up with China. So we'll get into that. Before we get started, my friends, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member by clicking that Join Us button, and you will get access to exclusive uncensored segments from this show, Monday through Thursday at 8 p.m., we will have a members-only show coming up for you tonight at 11 p.m. You don't want to miss it. Not family-friendly, so... Tends to be sillier, a bit funnier, but definitely not something for your kids to have around. So don't forget to also smash that like button if you're watching on YouTube. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends if you really do like it. Word of mouth is the, is the most powerful thing you can do to help. Joining us tonight to talk about this and so much more is Steve Dace. Happy to be here, man. I've heard a ton about your show. I've seen a lot of your episodes, especially in the last 24 hours. Everybody warned me you guys like to do uh, snotty gotcha questions. I Do freaking it. love snotty gotcha questions. Why did you wear that shirt anyway? Okay, exactly. <laughs> because when you wear plaid to hopefully distract people from everything else that you visually bring to the table. See, anything you do to try to corner me, I will put myself down even more. So I'm ready to go. All right. So, so for those that don't know you, who are you? What do you do? I work over uh, at the Blaze. Um, I'm, you know, when I was growing up, the, one of the most coveted TV slots you wanted was uh, after Cheers. That's where Seinfeld debuted, News Radio debuted, because after Cheers was on, I mean, you, you were going to have to really suck not to hold the audience, right? So I get to do the show at the Blaze after Glenn Beck, right? So it's really hard to not be successful. You just, you know, just try to hold on to as much of his audience as you possibly can. And I'm barely hanging on. And so they were dumb enough to sign me to a, a contract extension for another three years nah, uh, back sure in January. A, you pulled a fast one on those guys. I did. Or, or no one else wanted the gig. One of the two. Yes. There you go. Yes. Right on. All right. That should be fun. So thanks for joining us. You bet. Have a blast. We got Hannah Claire Brimlow hanging out. Hi, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. You should definitely follow TimCast News on Twitter and Instagram. They are excellent platforms to get your news from, as okay. I've heard. I just want to point out, I think it's funny that you're wearing an American flag. Yeah, your, I'm really into like, the and inception. behind you. Yes, that's the wood one. This is the knit one. I just want you guys to know that I am definitely from America. Don't question Aren't it. Aren't you Canadian? By, by I was birth. born here. Oh, nice Stop work. questioning my anchor baby life. I got problems. No. And one of them is the military industrial complex. Maybe we'll talk about that tonight. <laughs> Steve, also writer, director, or uh, I guess director? Producer. Have, producer as well, executive producer of Nefarious upcoming. Comes out in theaters on April the 14th. You can go to the website, whoisnefarious.com. We actually pulled it off. We made a right-wing horror film. They said it couldn't be done, or maybe no one's ever actually tried it before. We, I think, pulled it off. We showed it to some of your uh, people earlier today, and man, I got some really cool feedback. So cool. whoisnefarious.com is the website, and 
If you're going to let me shill, then uh, we've got a brand new book out, Rise of the Fourth Right, Confronting COVID Fascism with a new Nuremberg trial. So this never happens again. We, we, we fashioned this book like a mock Nuremberg trial. We have witnesses. Everybody's on the record. We have every interview recorded, whistleblowers from the Department of Defense, healthcare sector, people whose family members were medically kidnapped or allowed to die in hospitals, denied of treatment. This book is going to blow your freaking mind. And if you were not already paranoid, if you were not already pissed, okay, if your blood was not already clotting, it'll be boiling when you read this book. Oh, wow. All right. We got Surge pressing the buttons. Yo, what's up, everyone? Surge.com. Ready to start when you are. Let's jump into this first story. We got us from TimCast.com exclusive video. James O'Keefe tells Project Veritas staff, I've been removed from CEO and board. I have been stripped of my authority as CEO and removed from the board, contrary to what any public statements may say. He gave, uh, uh, I think it's like a 45 or around 45 minute speech. And uh, an anonymous source provided this video to us. We uploaded it uh, on YouTube and published it. And uh, James basically lines out, he says, throughout my 13 years here, our mission has evolved from simply being about exposing the truth with help from some hidden cameras to something more transcendental, giving people hope. He says, as I was going through this process, I reflected upon my appreciation for so many of you. What makes us great is that we do this work because we believe we have a passion and a flair for storytelling. He gave a big speech. I recommend you guys listen to the full 45, 45 minute speech. I can't uh, break the whole thing down uh, in only a few minutes, but there, there are some things I want to point out. The article says Tim Cast News has also been provided with board minutes regarding O'Keefe, which included an indefinite suspension without compensation. And the funny thing is, maybe if we I think um, it gets cut off right here we go. This is a, 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 an image that we received. Indefinite suspension of Mr. O'Keefe as CEO without compensation. Well, that's strange. Didn't they say before that it was paid time off? Now we can see here in this document, it's not paid time off. There's more. They, uh, in this image, uh, I, think, I think this is, uh, this is, I believe it's something different. Let me pull this one up. Indefinite suspension of Mr. O'Keefe from the board pending the results of the two-dimensional audit. So here's what we have. I mean, so I just want to show you. Here's the, the full video you can find at youtube.com slash TimCast. I don't know if it was uploaded anywhere else. Uh, I believe the video of James giving the speech was leaked to a bunch of different news outlets. And uh, I, will, I will say this. People are not having it. Project Veritas on Twitter is currently down 133,349. Let's refresh and just see what happens if it's the same. Yeah, 1, 133,585 followers have unfollowed them on Twitter. And we have this statement from Veritas. Take a look at this. This is where it gets, yeah, I, I get the most offended. Here are a few examples of what has been uncovered so far by PV leadership. Here's the first thing I'll say. James O'Keefe is Project Veritas. He started it. He's the one who paid the prices for it. And I assume most people are donating for him to do what he does because they believe in him. They say $14,000 on a charter flight to meet someone to fix his boat under the guise of meeting with a donor. Sorry, I just literally don't believe it. That just sounds like nonsense. And here's the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. If James didn't do the right thing, in, in, or he tried to by starting a nonprofit, if James just did a private corporation and said, donate money, it's not tax, tax deductible and I can do whatever I want with it, nobody would bat an eye at James O'Keefe getting a private jet. Not that I believe that he would mis, misuse funds this way. Here, look at this one. $60,000 in losses by putting together dance events such as Project Veritas Experience. That, I disagree with. Those are not losses. Those, those are some of the most memorable Project Veritas experience. Exactly. Well, also, doesn't Turning Point USA put on all kinds of dance event stuff for students? Yep. Like, it, it, if nonprofits lost money on one thing but made it up in a different area, that's okay, right? They have to, they're, not everything they, they're going to do is going to be financially successful, even if ultimately it works out to be in the green. Yeah, these show different dynamics of James and the crew, the people that he's working with, that it's not just some stodgy news organization. I think it enlivened a lot of young people to get involved because he's also a, an artist, mm -hmm. like a dancer. So I think that was fantastic uh, the, use of funds. The story I, I was just telling Ian, we did an event in New York with Mines and James O'Keefe was there. And there's a, there's a side stage area. It's kind of like backstage. And there's a group of, uh, there's a bunch of people getting ready to go on. And I see James and I'm like, James, do a moonwalk. And then the whole room breaks aside and everyone stands there as James O'Keefe moonwalks perfectly through the side stage. That kind of thing, in my opinion, I know maybe it's silly, but that is not a loss. When James was doing these videos, 
he was making a character of Veritas that was something more than just a hidden newsroom that sometimes posts viral clips. It was giving character and personality. This is ridiculous. I'm sorry, it man. It sounds personal because if this was about money and he cost the company a couple hundred thousand dollars, him leaving and all these people leaving, like these are the hardcore donors that are leaving. The last mm -hmm. 13, 130,000 people are the people that are going to throw 10 bucks a month at Project Veritas. That's I mean, 1.3 million. The donors already filed that cease and desist letter, right? They said, we want our money back if you are getting rid of James. We, are, we gave mm -hmm. because of him. And so therefore, if that if he's not there, then this is not the organization that we gave money can they, to. Can they get their money back? Is that legal? I have heard some organizations do it. Other times not. I'm not an expert on it. Uh, it's it's an uncommon for ple for people to be able to donate money and then take it back. So it sounds like it would go to court, I assume. It sounds personal. It sounds like they some people really didn't like the way James was doing it. And um, because if they want to or if it was about money, then they made a really stupid fiscal error in removing James because he's a moneymaker. To me, th there's there's two consequences of this that I think kind of even transcend what your own views are of James and, and just to go on the record, I, I think the I think it could be argued Project Veritas is the most and has been under his guidance, the most important information outlet in alternative media in the country. Uh, going back to you know their their origin, their genesis with Acorn and things of that nature, and I find, I find it fascinating is the guy that just wrote about COVID, uh, a definitive book about COVID fascism, that somehow all of these issues somehow immediately have to come to a head after they just did the ultimate sting operation on the demons over at Pfizer. I, the timing of that I find incredibly not coincidental. And, I, I, and just real quick, James, I, he says this, the only thing that changed was the biggest story mm -hmm. they, in their history with over 50 million views. And he said it's like a 10x increase over their other biggest stories they've done it, so let, let's let's set us but set aside him for a second and your views of him and just look at running an organization and leadership i own my own company i own my own show you got you own your show we have employees we have organizations i've been a part of presidential campaigns corporations here's the reality of of those ecosystems number one um i hope they have lawyered up because by them d even claiming these things in disclosures, they have not that, frankly, the Biden feds uh, need much of an invite anyway. They just do it on their own. But they've essentially begged for a full audit of all their books from the feds to come in and say, oh, OK, you guys have disclosed this. Then let's see what else is under there and see if we can just finish your organization off while we are at it. And then number two, though, let's let's play devil's advocate for a second. And let's say there is some merit to maybe he wasn't kind. That was their previous story, right? He wasn't the kindest boss. Now the story is some form of malfeasance. Let's say there's a root of truth to them just for the sake of devil's arg argument. You don't take the star quarterback of your team after he just won the friggin' Super Bowl and decide that now's the time you want to have a conversation with him about being a, a kinder, gentler, better teammate and 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 um, being a better steward of the team's resources. He just won the Super Bowl, man. Hand him the trophy, let him take pictures, and celebrate that. There were times before that moment that you could have addressed these things, and there's times later in the offseason when there's not as much eyes, there's not as much pressure, where these kinds of things can be addressed. This is, as you said, Ian, it's either personal or, or the, the oversight and leadership and guidance of this board is every bit as culpable, if not more so, of what they claim James is guilty of, even if he's guilty of those things. How come no one stepped in before this? How come no one said, hey, you know what, now given, we're at, we're at a next level here, the level of eyes that are on us, the level of pressure that's on us, we've gotta make sure we're even more diligent than we ever have been before. No, suddenly out of nowhere, he gets his, he scores his biggest, gets his biggest score in the history of the organization, and now suddenly we wanna have a human resources review? That is some really crap Happy leadership on behalf of that board, even if they are telling the truth. Yeah, I think those are all great points, especially since uh, Project Veritas, as far as I know, has their nonprofit status in New York. And to get out of New York, you're at the will of the attorney general, which New York has one of the most mm -hmm. activist, liberal attorney generals, Letitia James, in the country, in my opinion. I mean, it puts them in a terrible place as an organization. If the mission is so important, why would you do that? And to your point, too, like, Every circus needs a ringleader, right. and James O'Keefe is this circus's ringleader. To, to kick him off when you are kind of building this huge momentum off of the Pfizer thing seems like, it's hard for me not to think that there is something that James was about to do that the board didn't want him to. That's not financial. James should file, um, I don't know, what do you think, LLC? He should immediately create something new, and it should be a for-profit corporation. And people need to understand 
they're that the, they a lot of people think nonprofit means charity and goodness. Mm -hmm. It certainly does not. The, a lot of a lot of these companies are just they they exist to enrich people. They could be tax havens. You can run. I mean, some of these some of these biggest nonprofits that you've heard of will have like a ninety eight percent administrative cost ratio, and I think it's like it might have to be at least ninety percent. I don't know. They may have changed laws, but this means that when you give a dollar, ninety cents goes into the pocket of the administrative staff, and ten percent or less can go to the actual cause. Right. That is, and I've worked for a lot of nonprofits, and I've seen some that do fifty fifty, and even that's considered really bad. Some good ones will brag and be like, 80% of your donation goes to the actual cause, mm -hmm. and the administrative costs are a reality of doing business. It just basically means that if they're like, save the dogs, 80 cents goes to actually rehoming a dog, and 20 cents is paying the managers to file the paperwork to rehome the dogs. But when you see one of these big nonprofits, and you know their ratio is like 90% administrative, yeah, that means n almost none of your money is actually doing any charitable work. So here's what I would say. James should form a new company, and it should be a for-profit corporation which means it won't be tax deductible. But there are enough people who support Project Veritas that he need only say for 10 bucks a month, I was just gonna say you that. get yeah. James O'Keefe's premium behind the scenes, mm -hmm. director's cut you know, commentary on our stories and our views, and the news is always free. Mm -hmm. yeah. So not, a, a, not too dissimilar from what we do with like, here's the mm -hmm. free show. Yep. I think he'd make even more money and he'd then be able to, without question, wanted to get a private jet to go get his boat fixed. I got to be honest, James deserves to have a private jet to go get his boat fixed, considering the risks he's taken to his to himself. And others, I don't think he actually did that, though. That's ridiculous. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to meet a donor. Better have the company book me a private jet. That's that's ridiculous. Yeah. So, well, maybe he met with a donor who wanted to donate to Veritas and did, but also t got took his boat taken care of. And the same donor also fixed his boat. Who knows? But this like is but this is the thing, too. Like one of the claims they made, I guess, in these internal documents is that he used the money. Do they have that here? Let me let me see if they have it here. Something about um, like a wedding or something like he used the money to pay for his wedding. And it's just like he's not married, you know, and, and apparently it was a venue used for a corporate party. They're just taking things and twisting it to accuse him of doing of, of doing things that are wrong. But I think, Steve, I think you, you, you put it perfectly. I would be more willing to believe this if privately a board member hit me up and was like, look, yeah. we're, we're trying to figure this one out. Yep. What should we do to, to boot him from the company abruptly to then publicly accuse him of abusing employees? And that note said some of these signatories of this letter have not witnessed or experienced any abuse. Now they're coming out after uh, the donors refuted that saying, well, well he was misappropriating funds. It's like, I, okay, you're lying. It's a coup. You're just making stuff yep. up. It's also interesting that, you know, he's off Project Veritas, the nonprofit that we know about, but then he's also off of their uh, political action committee, right? There's the project, I don't remember what it's called, but it's a 501c4, mm -hmm. which they're allowed to participate in political campaigns, right? As we're going into an election year. And who do you think is like the most dangerous asset to anyone in politics right now? James O'Keefe, because he has such a reputation as an investigative journalist. I mean, to take him out, of the organization right now, to me, it, it's deeply uh, suspicious. I care a lot about James' health and like just personally, I know him, I like him a lot and I, I'll spend times like being afraid for my friends sometimes and being like, I don't want that person to get hurt. I felt like that about Obama too. I was almost like, please don't, don't, don't go against the deep state, Barack, because they'll kill you. But then what happened was he just didn't go against the deep state and played ball. So like, but I think James is just a guy and the organization that he created is an organization of hundreds of people. I don't know how many people. And they're all, from what I met at Project Veritas, those people are fantastic. And they do incredible work. I think it's like 65 or 65 something. 65 people. Yeah. I mean, they're they're putting their lives, essentially their livelihoods on the line by exposing you know corporate corruption. And, and they can't come back. Once you take this job, it's not like you can go back into the field you're in, right? Um, it's A lot of them are undercover, so they're, you don't know who they are. Those mm -hmm. people hopefully can assimilate back in. But, you know, if you're going to put your face on the on the the movement. But like, I, I think it's important not to put all the weight of this entire thing on James. Like he's part of it and he will continue to be part of the movement, whether or not it's with this company or another company. Uh, but I think it's the time to take the heat off James is now like Veritas will continue and it'll continue to expose corruption. And if they are corrupt, they'll get exposed. I don't know. I, I don't agree. I think Steve, you nailed it. Uh, they, th them coming out publicly and announcing financial malfeasance is 
It's, Ask it's, yourself it's, who but, wants to. There's an old adage in sports: you never want to be the guy that follows the guy. You want to be the guy that followed the guy who followed the guy, right? So the organization just got rid of its founder uh, and its face, and there really wasn't another face because, as you guys have pointed out, everybody else that is known in the that that has done public work has done it undercover. So he is the only known face of that organization. Who would right now? given the amount of heat that that is taking right now, on top of the open invite, they literally just hiked up their skirts and said to the feds, we're open for business. We showed all the leg we've got all the way to the panty line. Who wants to walk in there and say, yeah, I think I want to take that. I want to, I want to take that uh, Dutch door action. I want to get screwed on the way in and screwed on the way out. I'm going, to, I'm going to take over for a guy that's a legend to his base. And then at the same time, yeah, the, the, the people that just hired me opened up uh, and, and invited the feds to come in for an investigation. I, well, I, I think that is probably a pretty small list of people. Only, take, take a look at this. Only over. Elon Musk. I think Elon, no, it's kind of a joke, but geez, that's something Elon would do. Send me in. Elon, Burning does not hurt. They announced Elon's the new CEO of Veritas. Look at this. Year revenue in 2020, Veritas brought in $22,034,000. I can only imagine with this Pfizer video. Here's what I think. It's the money. And, and I'll tell you why this. Some people are like, I think Pfizer came in and did something. I'm not so sure about that. That, that would be bad PR wise. Like you don't want to pour fuel on a fire of a story by. I'll, I'll, I'll do, there's a story of these activists who were protesting outside of a McDonald's, saying McDonald's was bad. McDonald's sued them, won, and then their stock tanked because the news reporting was that massive corporation attacks mm -hmm. to private individuals. Pfizer has got to be like they, everyone's cheering these guys on. If we go after them, it's going to hurt us. Let's ignore it. Here's what I think. In 2020. Take a look at these numbers. In 2019, Project Veritas brings in $12,151,496. One year later, they nearly double their revenue to $22 million. How much money do you think is going to come in now that they had the biggest stories, this biggest story ever in the history of Veritas? I can only imagine they're going to hit 40, 50 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm way off with uh, that. 40 was my first thought. 40, right? Mm -hmm. Now imagine you're on the board and you're like, Guys, look how much money we have. I've, I, I could never have. And then James says, we are not using the money for what you want. We are going to use the money the way I see it. And we're going to do the mission. And I don't think the board members necessarily are thinking I'm going to stuff my pockets. But they're saying something like, let's use the funds to build a new building. And we can start doing this and that. And we can put a gym there. And then James is like, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to expose this. You got to get rid of. This is what I said when we first got word that he was suspended. If you want access to the cash, you've got to get rid of the ideological founder who's standing in the way of that big pile of money. Mm -hmm. Now for them to come out with a new excuse that you is misappropriating funds, it's it's projecting. Right. It's what we typically see from these leftists. They accuse others. Well, they've got of, board members posting their pronouns in their Twitter bios. And, and accusing someone else of well, malfeasance. And how do board members get on board? They donate to the organization, typically. right? Yeah. So if you had a year like this, and again, like I used to work in fundraising, the, the top amount of money comes from a very narrow number mm -hmm. of donors typically, right? So I think, yes, they have really great grassroots support, but there are probably a couple new donors who saw the work they have done and said, I am willing to really either scale up what I'm giving or I'm willing to give a huge donation for the first time. Now, that's a threat to all the other board members, right? They are in, potentially going to lose their position if they are now competing with these other high dollar donors. I think that this is a sketchy thing to do, especially when your organization is, is uh, doing so well, has this big story out, unless you personally feel threatened. I, it seems like James is uh, intimating. It's it's Pfizer. He, he said the only thing that has changed is that we broke the biggest story in our organization's history during the last week of January in 2023 with 50 plus million views. Our video became a global phenomenon. He then goes on to add more context and says that is the only thing that has changed. Then suddenly an unusual emergency happened just a few days after the story, he continued. And then he says on Thursday, February 2nd, I was informed by an officer of Veritas on the phone while en route to the airport that he would resign unless I stepped down as CEO. Can I want to address that the Pfizer connection? I got a I got a question on my show over at the Blaze today. Someone asked me. Why, what would be Pfizer's incentive to produce a product or any product that could potentially be harmful to its customers when its customers are, um, you know, are people in, uh, in need of health care? You and I aren't Pfizer's customers. Governments are. Gov you, no one within the sound of my voice paid for a COVID vaccine. 
Governments paid for all of those. You're not paying for Paxlovid. I know okay. some people who did pay for it. Uh, the, the, they were doing like $100. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Like, but but in, okay. in general, <laughs> in general, in general right, yes. governments are... I'm being pedantic. I know. But governments, <laughs> and that's all right to be exact, governments are the clients. What, Fi, what, what he put out with that video didn't put heat on Pfizer. They're indemnified going back to 1986, further in, uh, under Reagan, further indemnified by the PERP Act under, uh, or, uh, the PREP Act under, under Trump. The, the heat's not on them. That, that hay's in the barn. They've cashed all those checks. The heat is on, the, is on governments. People aren't calling Pfizer after they watch those videos. They know that, 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 that nothing happens calling Pfizer. The, God bless, there was a group of New Yorkers over the weekend that uh, did a rally in front of uh, Pfizer, uh, speaking my love language, chanting Nuremberg to Adam. I and mean, that's my love language. But that doesn't do any good. The, the governments are the clients. Israel let Pfizer essentially experiment on their population for an entire year. That's what our government did. That's what almost every major government in the world did with Pfizer and Moderna. They let their people be the real-time human trial in real time, in public. So, well, and so when, when he puts that video out, Pfizer, Al, the, the horse doctor, Al Borla at Pfizer, he's not sweating it. Governments are. The horse doctor. Yeah, that's what he was. <laughs> he was a horse doctor. All right, and, and so the, the veterinarian at Pfizer is not sweating it. The, the governments are. The governments are still somewhat, depending on what your views of elections are, somewhat still accountable to their people in ways that the corporation at Pfizer is not. And that's a whole new layer of heat. And it's not just our government. People around the world, guys, watched those videos and said, hey, why is the German, do you guys know what's going on with excess deaths in Germany right now? Mm -hmm. They're higher what? right now than they have been in the entire time of COVID-19. They're higher right now in Germany, 40% higher than normal. That's higher than they were at the peak of, of, the, of, the, of the initial wave of COVID well, in 2020. They're, they're, How do we explain those things? His video opens up that entire Pandora's well, box so, so for all these governments. We'll slow down and go back and, and address a lot of this stuff. Uh, what's, what's the name? Al, Albert Borla? Yeah, Albert Borla. And yeah. he, he was literally a horse doctor. He was doc. literally a horse doctor. So but, you but, hold, but hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, it, you're not being cute. You're like, no. he, he actually was treating horses yes. specifically. Yes. You, uh, so you, when they tried to tell you that ivermectin was horse paste, no, it wasn't. Ivermectin's a Nobel Prize winning drug from 2015. It was repurposed for animal use because of how effective it was for humans. We do that with a lot of drugs, by the way. A lot of our human antibiotics are repurposed for animals. All right. Well, so, he was actually a horse doctor. They're but, always so, guilty, guys. <laughs> They're always guilty. They're always guilty of what you accuse you of. So wait, wait, Trump, wait. Trump's compromised by a Russian P tape. It turns out Hunter Biden is literally filming his compromise videos with Russian hookers while they're accusing that of truth. They're always, uh, always guilty of what they so, accuse so you of. That's actually interesting because we often talk about the Ukraine gate, how they accuse Trump of doing what Biden actually yes. did. But the P-tape thing actually is a good point too because it was Hunter Biden. Yes. But anyway, and now anyway, it's anyway. horse pace, but it was actually, right. he's actually a horse doctor. I, just wanna, I wanted to point this out because um, I don't know, a lot of people probably don't like Rick and Morty, but you know, the, the mom in the show, Beth, is a horse surgeon. And they make fun of her, calling her not a real surgeon, and she gets really offended by it. And it's just funny that this guy is like a horse doctor. He's like not a real doctor. Mm -hmm. He like works on horses. But I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up anyway. But uh, you know, here's what I think. I was going to have this question for you a, a few sentences ago. Is that cause you, you talk about Nuremberg, you know, your book Rise of the Fourth Reich and all that. We, we, we've had a lot of libertarians come on this show and talk about, I don't know where you end up on the, on the economic scale or whatever. I'm not entirely convinced that... Um, this is a problem that is completely free uh, or could be solved by laissez-faire capitalism or just straight capitalism. No. I, think, I think this is a problem of it. Mm -hmm. I think what happens is, as much as I prefer, you know, capitalism over, say, like a socialist system, don't get me wrong, I do think there's still an issue here. And of course, the issue, uh, let, let, let's, let me slow down and walk through this because I understand government is a problem in this one. Here's the problem we face with solving an issue like this. Government mandates things because they're lazy, inept, evil, or otherwise. Some are ideological and think now's our chance. We have, you know, lockdowns are good for the climate and things like that. Others are panicked and say, well, my people are screaming, do something. They don't care what I do as long as I do something. Then along comes a big pharmaceutical company who you mentioned correctly, the governments are the customers. The government says, this is it. I'll take public funding. We'll, we'll, we'll buy products from this, this major pharmaceutical, and then it looks like I did something. The major pharmaceutical says, we don't care. We're immune, mm -hmm. and we have guaranteed government contracts. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect storm of government cronyism, government corruption. You're describing fascism, of course. Right. 
And ulti- ultimately what it is is the lucrative merger of corporation and state. Elites in the public and private sector, the classic definition of fascism. But what I see culturally, governmentally, and, 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 and in the corporate system, I don't necessarily believe is definitively mustache-twirling villains who are trying to destroy the planet. I know we've had many con- uh, conversations about population reduction, about how, uh, you know, the New York Times, I think, I think it was the Times wrote that the lockdowns, the planet's healing now, and that maybe we need climate change lockdowns. They literally use the line from Avengers Endgame when Captain America says, well, you know, after half the world was uh, disappeared, the animals are back in the Hudson. Yeah. Wow. But I, I, I kind of just feel like it's more like a Jackson Pollock painting than something as precise as Rembrandt. It is quite literally the chaos of our cultural decay, the system itself breaking down in every different area that we've got, cultural collapse, corporate Mm -hmm. and governmental collapse, that results in nobody wanting to take responsibility for the hard decisions and just saying, path of least resistance and leave me the F alone. And so we get all of this mess. I think it's it's all of the above. I I think that, first of all, the number one issue at play here is the spiritual and moral decline of the West. And you are watching a level of, of spiritual darkness and malevolence. I had, uh, we had we had a private dinner with Tucker Carlson out in Iowa this summer when he came out to MC an event for us. And one of the questions we asked him was, hey, what happened to the, the bow-tied, smiling libertarian who was friends with Rachel Maddow on MSNBC and CNN and thought, frankly, people like us you know, these dreaded, uh, you know, Jesus freaks that uh, we were the death knell of the Republican Party and we're going to be the reason why y'all never won any elections. How did you become our favorite talk show host? What what happened with you? Because this isn't the same guy that was on MSNBC 20 years ago. And he said something I thought that was very profound and I think really does sum up the era in which we live. He said, you know, I, I'm a kid. I grew up in Georgetown, Tucker said. My dad was a GOP operative. Everybody I was around we're political, uh, you know, kids of politicians or political operatives. We trick or treated together. We hung out together. We went to school together. We did Christmas together. I could see why someone might think Medicare and Medicaid might be the best way to help a certain disadvantaged group of people, even if it, my ideology doesn't agree. But I don't think that causes me suspicion about your motivations. He says what's happened in this current era in America uh, and really throughout the West is decisions are being made that no one truly benefits from. Like we can disagree vehemently, uh, you know, ideologically about affirmative action, but somebody is affirmatively benefiting from that, even if we think the the overall collateral damage doesn't justify it and you disagree with that, there is someone benefiting from it. No one benefits from kids being sent off to uh, the island of Dr. Moreau for meatball surgery. No one's benefiting from that. No one's benefiting from the stuff that we're talking about right now. And he said, when I analyze this as a kid who just grew up in the, in the traditional political process, and I, and I see people and I go to my liberal friends and I'm asking, why are you guys doing stuff like this? And they suddenly don't have answers, but they're just going to do them anyway. He goes, that's when I just had to realize that there's a level of spiritual darkness at play here. That's the only thing I can explain when this level of nihilism, and that's what you just described, Tim, a comprehensive nihilism, yep. whether it's people's craven greed, whether it's they're, they're, they've given themselves, another group has given themselves over to Malthusian ethics at a nihilistic Nietzschean level, okay, of depopulation, whether it's all of those things, whether it's stupidity, whether it's complacency, pour all that stuff in a cauldron add a little dash of newt and an eye of bat, okay, and a cup of water and boil it together and pour it out. And, and it, what you see is systemic decline of a civilization. And that's what we're living through right now. How do we reinvigorate spirit? Like Jesus tried, but they just killed him off and made a religion out of him. And they're like, worship him now. And it's like, dude, he was trying to wake people up to God. How do we, anytime I've seen in the past, people try, they get co-opted and cults get made out of them. And then they just... The war machine moves on. The Roman Empire started a church. Well, here's what I, here's what I would say. No one remembers almost any of the names of the Roman war machine. Everybody still remembers Jesus' name. We mark time, by the way. We, we mark time. Human civilizations mark time by the birth and death of Christ. All right? The most, the, the, the most attended worship event in the, of the year in human civilization for going on a second epoch is the is the is the marking of the resurrection of Christ followed only by 
the marking of the birth of Christ. So I would argue his legacy is very intact. When it's those of people like me who believe that he is God, that he was resurrected, and the, ch- the testimonies that we have of the changes that have gone on in our lives, and then we have gone on and helped other people and do things that are beyond our normal capability so we don't give ourselves over to the nihilism that Tim talks about, I would argue his legacy is intact. All the, the people that put him to death, they're all in the ground. All right. Nobody cares about any of them. But Christ is still exalted and hailed and worshipped 2,000 years later. So I think his legacy is in really good shape. I want to pull up this tweet from Marjorie Taylor Greene. She says, we need a national divorce. We need to separate by red states and blue states and shrink the federal government. Everyone I talk to says this. From the sick and disgusting woke culture issues shoved down our throats to the Democrats' traitorous America last policies, we are done. John Stewart says, but we get to keep the name, right? And then Nicole Pearl, Pearl Roth, Pearl Roth says, cool, California can keep the tech AG livestock. Georgia can keep their infant mortality, incarceration rates, and the country's lowest wages. I find it interesting. Yeah, you can see it. It's down here. Michael Malice. Uh, I, I love this topic, by the way. He posted the case for American secession from Observer, why it's time to disunite the United States. Marianne Williamson, did she just call for a civil war? Does she know what happened the last time a few states said they wanted to leave? It's a funny thing for Marianne to say, because like, yes, the Confederates did say, hey, we're going to leave. And then the the union was like, no, you're not. And then sent troops down. So uh, the funny thing is there are many people left. Sarah Silverman, I think she said this uh, a while ago, didn't she? Said something about uh, a national divorce. I know yeah. she has talked about it in the past. I don't know about Sarah Silverman specifically, but it's definitely something that comes up. So uh, I want to Google Uni- it. University of Virginia did, they have a center for politics. They did this poll last o- last October, and they found that like 50% of Trump supporters are in favor of a national divorce and, or a secession, and uh, 41% of Biden uh, supporters are also like, yeah, that sounds good. We'll, 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 we'll split up. I mean, it's it's a majority opinion that both political parties seem to hold, which is kind of wild. Yes, Sarah Silverman did say, maybe we should break up and divide into like two or three countries. So this is a this is a really, really great example of why we probably are headed towards a national divorce. The fact that Marjorie Taylor Greene, two years, okay, actually, I think to be fair, was it September? September, so a year and a half after Sarah Silverman calls for this, Marjorie Taylor Greene calls for it, and now liberals are angry. How dare you say something that Sarah Silverman said a year and a half ago? It's actually bipartisan, right? It's It's bipartisan. And not only that, Marjorie's led to the party. Uh, To me, we absolutely need a national divorce, which is why it'll never happen. (laughs) Because, first of all, as we just discussed with the James O'Keefe story, we can't have nice things in the era in which we live. But I think what we're up against won't let us go. I, I, you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses that have tanks, all right? The, 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 the same thing that, that has the Jehovah's, you ever have the Jehovah's Witness comes to your door on a Saturday? And it's always on the best weather Saturday of the year. Every time, it's like they always. plan it, yeah. always. It may just be that they only go out when it's nice out. That could be it too. And, and see, now I'm the guy that pushes back because I'm just that kind of douche. And so I will ask them questions like, so let me get this straight. Only 144,000 are going to be saved. Oh, yeah. Well, I Googled it, and there's 4 million of you. So maybe you all need to settle this argument amongst yourselves before you, you bug the <laughs> hell out of us on a Saturday. I witness tell me once, well, only that many will be saved, and they've already been selected. And I was like, so what are we then doing? Then leave me the hell alone. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> leave me the hell alone. But, but it's, it's that level. It's Lyndon LaRouchian. I'm in an airport hangar holding up signs about Margaret Thatcher 20 years after she's dead. Level of zealotry. That, that the spirit of the age, that these these sorts of statists, and who am I talking about? These are the people that put their pronouns in their bio, and before they had that, they had the Ukraine flag in their bio, and before they had that, they had their vax pass, or their, their vax card in their bio, and before they had that, they had their mask in their bio. Let me show how virtuous of a lemming I am to the spirit of the age, to the state. <laughs> that level of zealotry isn't going to let you walk away. They're here to fix you. They're here to fix you. And if you don't think you need to be fixed, you will be made to care. And the only reason the tanks aren't rolling yet is because you all own about 400 million guns. If you didn't, the tanks would be rolling already. Well, they're working on that part. Yeah. And so they're not going to let you. She's right when she says that. But any society that really needs that would not be able to accomplish it either because the divisions that exist, both sides are not going to agree to peaceably walk away. 
the, when you come to the brink, when you're about to ruin as much freedom, liberty, and prosperity as this country is about to flush down the toilet, that only happens because the forces that have pushed us to this brink are on some, you use the word cult, I use that in my show a lot, the level of cultic zeal that says, to hell with all those things. I have to win this argument no matter what. You cannot reason with that. Me, that level of zeal will not let you walk away. Let me ask you, how many uh, countries have the freedoms guaranteed that, that we have? Like the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, how many other as countries? As enumerated and, and itemized as us, I would argue none. Probably. I, th I think it's probably close to none. I think maybe Liberia has something similar because it was created by Americans or something like that. Not that it's really working out for them, to be completely honest. But uh, I have to wonder then if... It is a good thing for these bad people to see the U.S. break apart because it would remove one of the only true free or close to free as we can get societies. And look, the U.S. has, has its problems. It's not completely free. There's still uh, tribalism. There's all these issues. But man, I've been to some of these countries, been to countries where the cops will just kill you and that's it. The world is not. Look, I'll, I'll say watch Yellowstone. Have you been? Have you, ever, have you seen that show? Mm -hmm. I've been watching it recently, so I'm gonna use it as analogies nonstop. But in this show, they just kill people. You're in Montana, you're in the United States, but you're still in the Wild West, and they just kill people, right? You go to other countries, the whole country is the Wild West. You're in a city. Watch the videos out of Brazil. You ever see these Brazilian mm -hmm. videos? Mm -hmm. Dudes chilling in like a grocery store, and someone walks in with a gun, and they start shooting at them, and then it's motorcycles pull up and jump out and rob you, and then people start shooting at each other. I know we have those things happen here too, but it's not that bad. It's it's. We, we, we often think things are way worse than they are. And, and some things are worse than other countries. Don't get me wrong. Some countries are nicer. But I'm not going to sit here and act like Sweden because of its lower crime rate is better than the U.S. when the people in Sweden live under a boot and are scared to speak up and losing their jobs because their whole country is woke. The United States has a lot of really awesome things going for it, but we're losing it. And if people don't speak up, it's going to become bad. Now, as it pertains to national divorce, I think... That the challenge is, you know, someone super chatted that too much blood and treasure was sacrificed for this union. And that's an interesting point. I know Michael Malice, I know Luke Rutkowski, they talk about national divorce. And my the issue I have with it is, in the end, it benefits those who seek to subjugate the world. Because at the very least, it would split the territory of freedom in half. If the country breaks apart, then we know the blue states go full Canada. And, and then there's even less freedom in the world. Mm -hmm. It would be the greatest breeding ground for limited war the world had ever seen if the U.S. were to split in half. It'd be one side would be communist, Chinese funded, and then the other side would be the remnants of the United States or something like that. How's that like any that. different than what we have right now? Well, bomber planes would be dropping bombs on Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, like just I, that, annihilating I cities. That's why I don't justice. think it can be. But this is what you explained there a second ago, Ian, is why people want it. And then why I think we can't achieve it. We, we, we're talking, we got people want to rattle sabers about with China. What would a war between the US and China ultimately decide? The language the social credit system will all eventually go to is in. That's really what we're fighting for. That's what it is. That would, there, there would be no higher principle other than do you prefer Mandarin? Do you like Chinese hieroglyphics on your social credit score? Or do you want it accessible in English? Because every major cultural institution in this country either is already owned by the Chinese or aspires to be like them. And so we're already in the dynamic that you described. That, that dynamic exists now. But the end result of seeing it play itself out would also result in what you are concerned about. We are headed there. There's, that's unavoidable. Unless you start seeing great awakenings, what, where do we have liberty in America to begin with? It's not a coincidence you had great awakenings, spiritual revivals that then led to liberty in the country. All right? And, and that's why John Adams said, Constitution's only for a moral and religious people. You can't have limited government with people they think their character has no limits upon it. They'll then eventually think I can do whatever the hell I want and then make you pay the bill and the freight for it when it blows up in my face. That's what we have now called a welfare state. So eventually, we're going to either see revival like we saw at the dawn of the country, or you're going to see the end of the country. And that's the path that we're on right now. This is, is a point of no return. What does ri revival look like in a modern sense? Like, is it a return to patriotism? Like, how would you see symptoms of revival? Yeah, I love patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 it has to begin with an acknowledgement of the God that our rights come from. Do we believe in God? That's, that, to me, when, when Chesterton said America is the only country ever founded on a creed, that's really what he meant. That our rights 
come, and he was observing this as an English theologian, a British theologian, observing, you know, basically their offspring and, and how it had taken off after the Revolutionary War period. And that was his observation, is that America took the, the notion that rights come from God, the laws of nature and nature's God, and therefore they're not bestowed by governments, and therefore governments don't have the ability to take them away, and governments are just as accountable to that same God as the people that rights come from. Now we have civil rights, we don't have individual rights. We have group rights now. Uh, we, we don't have a, a justice system based on restitution anymore. That's what stuff like eye for an eye in the Bible means. It doesn't literally mean eye for an eye. It means what you have taken from someone else must be taken from you or you must restore it. There must be restitution. We don't have that now. Now, you're, now you've committed a crime against society. Everything is centralized. Everything's collectivist. We see this in healthcare. That's why we had, a, that's why we had COVID fascism because Obamacare ended the last vestige of the patient uh, provider relationship left in America. Men will pay for pap smears now. You're all on a community rating now. Everybody's a unit now. Everybody's a file. I mean, if you, if, if, dude, it, go back and listen to Bob Seeger's I Feel Like a Number from like 40 years ago. That's freaking prophecy on where we are right now. Californication by the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers is really about wokeism. That's what that's what Californication is, is the is wokeism. I used to sing about that in what, 2003 or something. That what's, was pro what was you just referenced 40 years ago? The Bob Seger's Feel Like a Number. Go look at, go Google the lyrics for that. It'll read like a prophecy of 21st century you, America. One of the problems of us all having rights given from God that we founded the country on, is, except for those people, those savages, they're not even human. They have no, they, they didn't even, they weren't even human to those people. They, they killed the Native Americans and slaughtered them. And the black people, where we're three fifths of a human uh, in the eyes of God, according to the founders. So, like, yeah, we say it's God giving us rights, but like, obviously, the history shows otherwise. We slaughtered ninety percent of the native population. Mm -hmm. We didn't consider him human. I mean, the people didn't even consider him human at the time, which is like the most abhorrent thing in the eyes of God I can imagine is that humans would consider another human non like an, a, a dirty animal non human and then kill it and say it has no rights. So how do we justify here's, here's, now? Here's the, here's the challenge, I think, Ian, is that everybody projects. And one of the big mistakes people make when it comes to any kind of historical conquest is the projection of your cultural values onto cultures that no longer exist or have deeply different values. So I, f I find this interesting in, 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 in history, the idea that all humans are sound morally and that we should agree with all of their ways of life. Like, you know, the Aztec notoriously would sacrifice people, rip their hearts out or whatever. What would they do? They put them out on an altar and mm -hmm. then like cut them open head. with obsidian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and and uh, while they're alive and yeah. things like that. So you got to understand Tripping that on mushrooms. even even deeply religious. I mean, like the, the the colonial Europeans were were deeply religious and probably very zealous in terms of their beliefs. But imagine how you would feel as this like somewhat liberal libertarian type modern man watching a bunch of people drag a screaming woman upstairs and then jam her in the chest with obsidian and cut her open in front of you, you wouldn't be thinking these are good people. You'd be thinking these just, these people are animals. Oh my, oh my God. I mean, not literal animals. You're saying that in a derogatory sense, like what is wrong with these people? I'm not saying every Native American population was that way. I'm just saying what happens is young people today look around at this society that we've built through blood and sacrifice, blood and treasure for, all of the death fought along the way. The Civil War itself, how many dead Union soldiers to preserve this Union, ultimately leading to the end of the Civil War. Not that it was the exact intention of the Civil War, but that was a big component of it. And then they say, look at this and say, all societies must have been this way, and the conquest, mm -hmm. conquest of such must have been wrong. And it's like, dude, like the, that group of people was going around murdering kids and raping women nonstop. Yeah, we all agree that was a bad thing, and they got conquered. You know, are we at the point of history where conquering and destroying is not the way forward again now? Like, are we truly there? Oh, no, no, I think no, it's just happening. being it's done differently. What, what, you're living in a post Christian America now and, and really a post Christian Western civilization. So what will come next? Exactly what preceded Christendom or Western civilization, the Dark Ages. That's what will come next. Now, these Dark Ages, the good news is you won't have to worry about dying of bubonic plague because rats are crapping in the street outside your home, okay, and, and that's getting into the water table. Well, we're too advanced technologically. This will be a technocratic Dark Ages, all right? So you'll, it'll look like, well, frankly, China. You'll have the accoutrements of modernity. You'll have a car. It'll be electric. 
and they will determine from a central hub how whether it comes on or not, how far you can drive. Um, you'll have access to the internet. They will determine what you can and cannot see and how often you can use it. You'll have a mobile phone. They'll determine you know who you can talk to and monitor everybody else. So it'll, it'll be a technocratic dark ages, all right? But it'll be a dark age for individual liberty uh, and, and individual agency nevertheless. I, outside of the outside, in the history of the human species, outside of acknowledgement of a biblical worldview on some level, even imperfectly, there has never been any regard for individual freedom and liberty in the 7,000 year history of recorded human history, period. Regardless of language, period, custom, culture, it's never happened outside of a biblical worldview because it's the only one that says men and women are each made in the likeness and image of God. It's the only one that ever has said that or proclaimed that, which is why outside of it, it simply doesn't happen. We don't believe in that worldview anymore, which is now why we went from feminism to now men are going to become women now and become even better women than the women were. We don't believe in anything. Amer the West is like the Joker, but not the Heath Ledger version. At least the Heath Ledger version wanted to prove a point. We had an argument. <laughs> the we're the Joaquin Phoenix version. We're the one that looks at Robert De Niro and says, I don't believe in anything. That's who we are. You know what? The reason I have issues well, with well, Christendom and well, why... I, I, gotta, I gotta address that one. The Joaquin Phoenix version is a combination of mental illness and anger at the system. I think you're, you're right. The Joaquin Phoenix version of, of Joker is basically a guy who doesn't understand what's going on and is just angry and entitled. So he kills a guy who helped him. Let me let me stress this because it's this a really, really good point, especially for those who, who know I love uh, pop culture references. The, the Joker film. Awesome. You guys have all seen it. Mm -hmm. Joker. Negative. Mm -hmm. No, you've not seen Joker. No. Amazing film. Okay. And spoiler alert. I think it's the perfect example of one. They show all the protesters in the streets screaming about the about the ninety nine percent about the one percent smashing things. He riles them up. This Joker character. In the end, they're like dancing and cheering for him, and that's basically the idea is that he gets these followers because he he kills this late night comedian saying you get what you deserve. Here's the funny thing about it though. This is about a guy who's mentally ill, and he's out, he's down on his luck. He's abused, and then finally he snaps and he kills some dudes on a train who were messing with him. And it's like, you kind of understand why he's so angry, but he really doesn't understand the system. He thinks Thomas Wayne's his dad. He's not. He's crazy. He does a stand up routine and he gets made fun of for doing it because he forgets his lines and laughs at his own jokes. A late night TV show host puts that video on TV and they all laugh at it. Mm -hmm. A true comedian at that point would be like, I did it. They're laughing at me. I figured something out. This is working. They're laughing. Let's let's roll with it. Rodney Dangerfield. I was just going to say, how many great comedians have made a routine out of self-deprecation? Ex and, yeah. and, and it was it was hilarious, and then you're with them. And so think about what this movie represents with Joker. He's a guy who does something really funny that everyone laughs at, but he gets mad because it wasn't the way they were supposed to laugh. So he goes on the show when given an opportunity, when they actually say, okay, come on the show in front of the world, and decides to kill the guy because they didn't give him what he wanted, because they didn't give him his emotional satisfaction. That's why he's a bad guy. And that's what I see today with the wokeness, with the protesters. They're mentally ill. They're unstable. They're angry. They're entitled. And they don't understand that our founding fathers and our ancestors have given them everything. That's why they hated the movie. That, that's why the forces <laughs> right. we're talking about hated this film, is they, they recognized it was the fulfillment of their own nihilistic worldview. This yep. is where it goes. Yep. yep, and then you get the uh, right. The, the Heath Ledger Joker was trying to prove a point mm -hmm. about. He says, if you know, if I if I told the news a busload of soldiers would be blown up, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. But if you say a mayor dies, and that they all lose their minds, and it's like, okay, well, he's actually got some method to his madness. Right, Walking Phoenix really represented, in my opinion, all of the wokeness. Mm -hmm. I w uh, I was gonna mention Christendom, which we were talking about earlier, and why I think there's a problem, why people are having a problem with it and have hated it for so long and want nothing to do with it, because it was used as a cudgel. He used God as a as a as a constrictive tool. And if you didn't worship God the way I want you to worship it, then we're gonna execute you. Or similar to what this Joaquin guy, like if they don't do it the way I want them to do it. So they would use it as a system of control. And you had someone like uh, Luther, Martin Luther, I think he said, it's between you and God. It has nothing to do with the church. Forget about those, the business, the bureaucrats. And uh, they tried to kill him uh, for that. And so I think people hate the business of, of church, not that they have, and they don't even know what God is or understand the emotions attached with experiencing that 
vibration. I completely agree with everything you just said. Yeah, I think people are turned off by religion, especially, you know, very dogmatic, legalistic religion. It can have very negative consequences. But it's hard not to think that the other part is that people don't want to have to be accountable for themselves, right? Like if you have yes. Christian, there's morality, there are things that are right and wrong that you have to hold yourself accountable to, that there Correct. are higher values, you set your eyes on the things above. And if you want to live an indulgent lifestyle here and now and only think about what concerns you today, then why would you want to be religious, right? If your pleasure comes from momentary satisfaction or uh, pursuing things that are wrong and bad for your soul, then like, of course you're you're not going to go to church. Of course you're not interested. And you can say, I think there are people who have been harmed by, you know, exactly what you're talking about. But I think there are also people who want to live for their own pleasure and have no higher moral consequences. Completely agree. I mean, I, 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 I'm going to be 50 this year. And so my, my generation, Gen Xers, we're the, we're the first post-sexual revolution, first porn generation, mainstream porn generation in America. My mom got pregnant with me at 15, actually 14, by her high school senior boyfriend. Found out over Christmas break of 1972. Um, then January, a, a month later, we get Roe versus Wade. She, the, originally, the cutoff was the first trimester. She's right at the cutoff. She has time. She can go get an abortion. Her mom is twice divorced five kids from two different marriages, living in the white trash part of town. That wasn't easy to do 50 years ago, let alone now, okay? Um, she decides in the end she can't go through with an abortion, so she has me at 15. We were on food stamps, ADC, all of that. She ends up marrying a guy out of the Navy um, who came from a very abusive background. Uh, he was very abusive to us, physically, mentally, verbally. I had a hard time for many, many years. I didn't become a Christian until I was 30. And, nor, and most stats show if you're not one by the time you, you're 18, you're, you, the, the odds you'll become one are very, very low. Why? Because a lot of times our first notions of God as a father come from the father that we had in our own home. And if the father in our own home cannot properly model that to us, it, the older we get, the harder it is for us to grasp that concept. And so it was very difficult for me to understand the idea of an altruistic God. It was very difficult for me to accept that. It was very difficult for me to look at the evil in the world and think that such an altruistic being could exist. It was very difficult for, then, then of course, I liked the way I was living and didn't want to change, as you just pointed out. And then I realized there's a missing component in all of this. We're all very anxious to question God's character. When do we start questioning our own? When does the questioning of our character begin? Um, and then you have to ask, well, who among us has the wherewithal? to judge one another's character. Are you perfect? You, 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 I'm not. So then we all realize no one's perfect, so no one can judge our character. So guess then what we don't have any more of? Character. No one's held accountable for, every, for anything. And so you have this systemic societal collapse, and, that's, and that becomes a feedback loop, and that's where we are now. And that's why I said we need revival. We need to, we need to remember that there is a creator. There is a better way than this. And yeah, you are correct, Ian. We could sit here with every worldview and we could pick out a few moments. I mean, have you ever had your heart broken by a woman yes. before? Did you, did, you, did, you, did you proclaim celibacy and decide for, for all like women? five years, yeah. Did you? Okay, but are you celibate now? No. All right, did you, are all women terrible because a few broke your heart No, and but they were you? for like seven years, man. And I, I made a lot of videos about my hate for women. And it, you were hurt, yeah. But eventually, though, the need that you had for that companionship, for that intimacy, eventually that need wore one out, did it not? Say that one more time. The need for that, for, for, for companionship, for, for intimacy, that need that you had, that desire, went out over the anger and the bitterness that you experienced because of the way your heart was broken, right? I think I didn't, I didn't know. I couldn't sense the need. I was desensitized to the, the want of, of a woman, of, of the connection of, of a relationship or emotions for like a decade. And I almost killed, you know, that was the end. But yeah. then I, I just decided to start over again. And, you know, I, still, I would I would encourage you. I would encourage you. Open up a Bible. Just you and God. One on one. Give God that exact same shot. Because a lot of the historical examples you're going to cite are true. Christians, Catholics and Protestants littered the fields of Europe with blood post Protestant Reformation for a century. All right. Our country figured out a way to keep those forces at bay through the way it, the, the things that Tim talked about that were enumerated in the Constitution. That's what no religious test for office meant. You've got all these colonies that are all founded by different vestiges of the Christian church. And literally, if you were a different denomination, you couldn't vote or be a citizen in some of these other colonies. They figured out ways to lawfully navigate 
those differences. But I would urge, and I'd urge not just you, anyone within the sound of my voice, this thing is doomed unless more of us get recreated with our, 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 our creator. And, and I, would, I would urge you, just open up a Bible, you and your creator, one-on-one, -on -one, and see if he answers. You know what's funny is that uh, a lot of liberals are starting to come around to this. Granted, most liberals aren't, but there are disaffected liberal types who I'm hearing, I, I, I don't want to call anybody out, but there are a few examples of prominent classical and traditional liberals who are saying, I'm not religious, but I now recognize the importance of mm -hmm. religion in society. Maybe I can give a shout out to at least one. I think James Lindsay has talked about mm -hmm. this. There's a few others. Uh, for me, uh, I grew up Catholic, so my family was always, to a certain degree, uh, a Catholic. Uh, for me, though, I kind of drifted away from it, but uh, I, I've long talked about this, and, and, and there was a period where I was like, I'm an atheist, but the way I would describe it now is I didn't understand anything about God when I was a kid because I didn't know what people were talking about, didn't understand what atheism was as a teenager because it was, again, just people around me until I actually started to read for myself. And then ultimately studying, I was reading books on physics and I was reading the internet and trying to learn about time. And then I started to think about all the things I learned in religious class when I was at Catholic school. And I was like, wait a minute. And I started to see a bigger picture here. But I think, interestingly, what many people have, have talked about, Peter Bogosian, James Lindsay, Helen Pluckrose in their, uh, uh, when, when they did the initial Sokol Squared hoax, I did a podcast with them talking about how this wokeness is a non-theistic religion. It has filled the Preach. gap. Yeah, it's it's filled the gap. Absolutely. Yeah. But the issue is, it is it is chaos to traditional religions order. And I think what you end up with is the one way I'll put it this I'll put it this way. The stories I heard when I was younger about Christians came from liberals. And it was I would describe as mostly anti religious propaganda. When I actually started to meet real conservatives and Christians, I was like, these people are nothing like they've been described to me. And ain't that the story of the culture war we're hearing right now? Absolutely. Trump's a fascist, mm -hmm. the far right, they're evil, they're racist, because they want to keep people on one side of the fire. Correct. And they want to say there's a wall of fire. Don't go near it, it'll burn you. But on the other side, people are chilling, they're good people. And so I remember one of the uh, important stories for me was meeting a friend I was in the suburbs of Chicago where it was more conservative, and they were pro-life, and I'd never talked to someone who was pro-life before. And they gave me very sound, reasonable explanations for their beliefs. They weren't too dissimilar to what my family had said, but they were a little bit on the other side. And I was like, well, these are these are these are normal arguments. These are not, this is nothing crazy. These people aren't insane. Like, what was all this stuff I was being told? So now what I think you see is with wokeness, you have what I would describe as just fire. It is spreading. It is a chemical reaction. It is a chaotic and destructive force. It's the Joaquin Phoenix Joker. It's the Joaquin Phoenix Joker. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's zombification. It's, it's the zombie undead version of our culture, of the things we believe. Like, racism is bad. We want to get away, away from that. We want, it, we want equality. The Constitution guarantees it. And then you get this zombified corpse version that's actually just infecting and destroying the institutions that we are actually trying to protect. We want to get rid of the bad stuff, keep the good stuff, and build upon it. It's just consuming everything and destroying it. The most dangerous conversation in America is the one Ian and I were just having. That's the most dangerous conversation. People have some disparate views on very on a very important topic, but are willing to sit down in a setting publicly in front of other people and hash them out and discuss them openly, share what's going what, share their own personal perspectives of what's gone on in their own lives as to why they've they came to some of the conclu conclusions they did or why they have yet to come to those conclusions or it took them to, this is, this is how we actually come now and reason together. The wokeness religion that you just described, everything that it does is to avoid this kind of a conversation mm -hmm. from occurring, whether it's, about, whether it's about faith, whether it's about ideology, whether it's about political parties, whether it's about particular issues. It's all to avoid this kind of neighborly conversation that allows differences to get discussed and hashed out. I want to we, we gotta do a hard segue and, yeah. and, and, and progress this because okay. we do have, uh, we have this story here from TimCast.com. Zelensky warns of World War III oh, if China oh. allies with Russia. I do see an opportunity for China to make a pragmatic assessment of what is happening here. I want to I want to I want to bring this up because uh, for those that are just tuning in or just ju jumping into the segment, we were talking about religion, cultural decay, societal decay. Joe Biden, the president of the United States, went on a surprise visit to Ukraine with a five hundred million dollar gift. You know, he could use five hundred million dollars 
People in Ohio? People Flint, in Ohio. Michigan? <laughs> People in Flint, Michigan. Project Veritas? Children well, in foster yes. care in America? I, I say yes to Project Veritas, but you know, in all seriousness, um, Pittsburgh's got a pipe problem. Yeah, got how a pipe about problem. we sprinkle some iron dust into the rivers in East Palestine and then put a magnet in there? Because what happens is the oil co- coagulates around the iron particles, and then you can use a magnet to get the oil out. Did but you guys hear Greta Thunberg's going to? Just kidding. Go ahead. Tom. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't. I don't she doesn't look, want to get look, sick. Look, it's, it's yeah. the simple. Yeah. We're being warned of World War Three. Zelensky says if China owls with Russia, we're being told the world is on the brink of destruction. Why would there be World War III if China allies with Russia? Oh, what he's actually saying is because the U.S. will blindly and unapologetically give Ukraine all the support that it ever wants. If China and Russia team up, yes, the U.S. will fall in line behind Zelensky and go into an international conflict between two superpowers or Jim- two world powers. Say. Jimmy this Dore was crazy. saying that how Zelensky is really falling in line behind the war machine. And if he says, no, we're going to have peace, that they'll just kill him. And that's I, 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 I think so. I'm just, I see this. World War III? What if the U.S. just says, not, we're, not, we're not interested in war, not over Ukraine? What if Russia and China team up and they say, we're now going to take Ukraine? And the U.S. went, you were not Ukraine. Have a nice day. What he's saying is the U.S. will do what Ukraine wants. Well, especially since we've already poisoned, po- poised all of our citizens, citizens to be obsessed with Ukraine. Do you remember all the flags everywhere all the time? Like, we made this an issue that apparently... Are especially liberal leaning voters are going to die on, right? So if, if Biden backs out, if he says, oh, actually, I'm going to cut off funds, then his base will turn on him and be like, how could you abandon the I poor people? I wish that were true. Ukraine? I think they'll actually just, oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Then I, I think they're that compliant. I think I, mean, just I, put I think a Joe Biden Democrat could do this on like, camera and say this is our new foreign policy. <laughs> Fart noises in the armpit, and there and that'll be the new that'll be their new avatar on Twitter tomorrow. I've got a, a pair of Vans shoes. They're blue with like a yellow stripe on it, and I've had people be <laughs> like West Virginia colors <laughs> or the Ukraine colors, <laughs> exactly. And I've had people be like, oh, you know, blue. I'm like, ah, well, come on, man, just shoes. West I'm, Virginia I forever. West Virginia shoes. We'll just th- call them th- West Virginia shoes. This issue, Isn't that weird it, with Ukraine is my last nerve. And and this is hard for me to say as a kid who's a child of the of the 80s, who grew up in the We're America Bitch 80s, who wore Alex P. Keaton monogrammed sweater vests, okay, and, and got up in the middle of the night to cheer Reagan bombing Gaddafi back to the Neolithic period. This is hard for me to say, okay? You're taking my, my high school age son to fight and die in Ukraine, literally over my dead body. I'm never allowing that. I'm never letting you take him to die for your Habsburg dynasty, World War I, needless 20 million pile of deaths replay over your elite's pissing contest. Not happening. I don't care what the threat is. I don't care what the penalty is. And if you think you're drafting my daughters, get the camps ready because you're going to need them. Never happening. This is, a, this, is, this is an example of history doesn't just repeat, it rhymes. This is a ha- these, are a, these are a bunch of elites a, a little cabal that are all throw Putin all of them all in together. This is a Habsburg dynasty pissing contest over a strip of land most people can't find, don't care about, has no strategic value to anybody within the sound of my voice unless they're involved in, in investing money with Hunter Biden. This thing is such a crock. It's so fake. It's so phony. It's one of the most simplistic, disgusting stories I've ever seen. It's one of the most cynical stories I've ever seen. It's wag the dog, but dumber. And 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 this. This to me is the final straw of just absolute civil disobedience. We're never fighting your damn war. Hell no. I think it's such pageantry. I think you're totally right. It's all fake. Right I mean, the fact that Zelensky can come to our Congress and not manage to put on a suit. Joe Biden goes to see him wearing a suit. Like, the, he's playing a character. It's so bizarre. He's the only world leader on the brink of war, apparently, or in the middle of war, who has to be in, I guess, camo? or whatever to convey to this people that yes in fact we are fighting so much so that he has time to do a Vogue cover shoot with his wife I mean it's just bizarre U2 he's got time for U2 concerts he's got time for U2 he's got time to make major public appearances around the world via via Zoom I guess he's not he can't leave his country but it's all for show he has to continuously say this is so drastic of course Lindsey Graham is saying oh Mitch McConnell uh, with his Ukrainian tie the most important issue in the country today is Ukraine, okay? Uh, Lindsey Graham-nesty. Uh, uh, well, I don't care about provoking Putin. Of course you don't. 
because you don't have any sons. You made that lifestyle choice. You don't have any sons. So nobody with your DNA, Lindsay, is going out there on those battlefields to freaking die for somebody's trust fund or grift fund. It'll be our sons. Those of us who do have uh, children, they're the ones that will go out there. It won't be Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's tried to kill himself with enough crack. We all know that. But it won't be him doing it. It won't be their sons dying. It'll be ours. Hell to the no. Never happening. Shove it up your ass. We're never doing this. But I think you need more Americans saying stuff like that. I remember when my brother, uh, he was a Marine, and he deployed to Afghanistan, did any of us think we should be there? It was crazy. And yet we have, we have been sending people to wars because we're, we say they're supposed to be there for a long time. I hope that Ukraine is a wake up call, right? That these are people who should not be going, that we're sending anyways for pointless things. But I just don't know that it will be. I hope it is. I like that you are likening it to the Habsburg dynasty, which is like a family that was obsessed with keeping the Germans. And I don't know the actually the literal history of the Habsburg family. Exactly, they were all married. They were all related. Didn't, didn't they yeah. have, was that where they had like the weird jaws and yeah. like the mm -hmm. deformities from? Yeah. They, they were like east of Germany, where they like Austro-Hungarian, Hungarian. Well, it, was, it, was, it was many after a certain point. It was just a lot of people. And they wanted in, inbreeding, basically. And they yes. were trying to control the descent within Europe. Yes. To yes. Yep. Yep. Maintain Germany. So they yep. they like that the Germans and the Russians are fighting. Because if the Germans had won World War One. What would, what would have been different? What was World War I fought about? No, not nothing. It was a, a pissing contest of elites. My group of my wing of the Habsburg dynasty will rule over yours, wasn't it? And that'll cost twenty million lives. Well, the only thing that came that was the only good thing we did in World War One is perfected friggin' distribution of mustard gas. We didn't do anything else. The what, tank what, wasn't it like the three tank? cousins a weapons that went to war. There was, it, they were all yeah, present. they're all related. All yeah. the Habsburgs. By the time we got to nineteen, by the time we got to nineteen fourteen, they're all related. They, this intermarrying within these empires had gone on for centuries. They're all related by the time we get there. Um, and so it's just literally a, it's literally a playground. Cross this, God, draw a line in the sand. Cross this line, your ass is mine. That's what we used to say when I was a kid. All right. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 the, the Archduke Ferdinand's son gets killed, or, or nephew was it? I think, can't remember, gets, gets assassinated. They cross the line. The, the other alliances come in, cross the line. Before you know it now, uh, the guns of August have fired 20 million people died for nothing. All we did in World War I was lay waste to Germany to give birth to the Third Reich and the worst regime that's probably ever existed in the history of humanity. Was it like just an arms development research program, the war, under the guise of a war? I, like, I, we want to see how our tanks fight against our tanks? As a kid born to a 15-year-old mommy, and I don't know what it's like to have so much of that inherent privilege that after a while you're just like, I got to fire off some of these rounds because I can't just throw them away. I don't know the answer to your question. I mean, my mom, I was on food stamps as a kid, so I, I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is there is no, if, if you look at traditional Christian just war theory, this is not, fighting and dying for Ukraine morally is not a just war, period. I agree with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. I, well, at least from this perspective, it doesn't look like it. I think that he wants Sevastopol, the, the trade port, and that he wants East 105, that freeway going down. If we act like dickheads, he's going to want East 97 and East 105, mm -hmm. everything east of the Dnipro River. But, I mean, I don't see why armistice isn't the focus. I'm not a, I am no fan of Vladimir Putin. I can't tell you how many times Russia today tried to book me on their shows, and I like never returned their calls. That all being said. Vladimir Putin didn't try to uh, turn me into an experiment for Pfizer and Moderna for the last two years. Right. Vladimir Putin didn't say, by the way, if you did not consent to being a member of said exper experiment, you can't work. Like literally like Mark of the Beast, you can't buy or sell stuff because how the hell are you going to buy or sell anything? You don't have a job. All right. So you can't work. I don't to, didn't say, hey, your family business is non essential. That, that, that business that your family's had for 100 years, that family farm, it's not essential anymore. It's got to go. We don't even okay? need to be so specific, to be completely honest. Vladimir Putin's on our doorstep. The, the, the Soviet Union doesn't exist, it collapsed. And this is a border dispute with Russia and Ukraine that for some reason the U.S. thinks it's worth going to World War III over. So I agree with your sentiment. We've got I agree with that too. The calls, if you look at our biggest problems, I often say to my audience on The Blaze or my Twitter feed, the calls are coming from inside the house. All right? The calls are coming from inside the house. We have, we've, got, we've got 90, you want to go to war with China? How about maybe taking back control of your medical supply that you gave them 80% of the manufacturing for? We can't go to war we, with we, them. How, dude, they're actually, some of the, they've actually, they actually make some of our own weapon systems. We're going to go mm -hmm. war with the country that, that makes all of our, uh, mm -hmm. all of our, our 80% of our antibiotics and some of our high-tech weapon systems that most of our elites want to be like anyway. The calls are coming from inside the house. The battle I, is here. I've often, uh, uh, we've talked about this quite a bit. What would happen if China declared war on the U.S. right now, 
If they said we are officially warring states, back the F off. Vitamin C, antibiotics, skateboards would be gone. People have no idea how much of the standard products we get are made in China and shipped here. If China said we're at war and cut off trade, what, half of our box stores would be empty. Mm. You'd be like, wait, where, I can't get medicine anymore? No, no, it's actually made in China. Isn't that crazy? They'd be just as screwed. So I don't think it, it doesn't really make I, sense for just, it. Just as screwed, I'm not so convinced. Oh, they, yeah, good they, point. They we, would, we then they get the amount of farmland they own, and they could just go Stalingrad on us and just burn the farmland to cut off our supply chain. I mean, we're, we're in this position because the great experiment of, of, of a progro utopian progressivism, globalism, didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is it ignores the basics of human nature. And this is, this is how crazy the times have, have gone. When I got into this business 15 years ago, Bill Maher was, was doing documentaries like Religi Religi I can't Re Religious. Pronounce. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, I, I was doing whole shows debating him on that. Now, now I do shows where I play clips of Bill Maher and affirmatively quote him. <laughs> All right? Even though I'm not sure he's changed any of his views, and I know I sure as hell haven't changed any of mine. But at, at, least, at least the old culture war, I liked the old culture war. The old culture war where people like me and people like Mar debated, we, we both agreed, first of all, that individuals have some agency and human beings have some rights of conscience. And the debates that people like me and people like Mar were having is what's the limit on that right of conscience, right? He basically is, is by his own admission, a libertine. He basically made the McKee, uh, Marquis de Sade argument. If I'm not hurting anybody else, nobody else's problem, you know, be, you know, do what thou wilt, that is the whole of the law. That was essentially his argument, okay? People like me made the argument, well, there's a little bit more to it because the one that gave us our agency and the one that gave us that uh, conscience has a few rights uh, of, of, of limiting it that we need to listen to for our own good. And that was the argument that we had is, is did people like me go too far? People like him go too far? Somewhere in the middle, a reasonable society could emerge. The new argument now is you have no individual agency at all. You have no rights of conscience at all. And so this is why, without changing our positions on literally anything, this is why Bill Maher and Steve Dace are saying a lot of the same things right now, because we are both recognizing that old argument about agency and conscience is out the window. We're actually having an argument whether we have any agency or conscience whatsoever. Yeah. Are we totally wards of the state from the moment we breathe? But also, I think Bill Maher started finally paying attention to the news. I think he knew more than he was letting on for a while. And he just didn't want to say anything because his audience is, it's liberals. But he got to that point where he's seeing this stuff and he's like, I just can't anymore. The, the issue, uh, and the, uh, this is exemplified by the Prager uh, episode where Prager said they're putting tampons in men's room. And the men's room and Bill Maher laughed and the audience laughed and everyone said, yo, oh, that's not true. Mm. And then Bill was like, that's for their girlfriends. What are you talking about? And Prager was completely correct. So I, I think, I think uh, has, has Bill Maher apologized for that? I think he may have addressed it. I think I talked about it recently. I can't remember. But what, what we've been watching for a decade, Bill Maher has only started paying attention to in the past couple of years. So I wonder if the issue is simply all of those things you were worried about 10 years ago in the old culture war, mm -hmm. Bill just didn't read. So he didn't know what he was talking about. Did, did he really think that tampons were in men's bathrooms to bring to their girlfriend? He, when, when Dennis Prager what? brought up that... He, Dennis Prager said, if you claim a man can menstruate, you're a liar. And everyone laughs. And he goes, that's what they're starting to claim. And who? And Bill's like, who? Who's saying? He's like, it's in the media. It's all over the news. Google it. Just Google search it. You'll see it. And then they all start laughing. And he's like, they're putting tampons in the men's room. And then Bill goes, that's for their girlfriends. Come on. No one's saying this. And they're all just laughing at him. And uh, of the course, Prager was completely correct. But Bill Maher, he's mm -hmm. how old is he? He's, six, he's in his 60s. He's not paying attention to what's going on. He has no idea what's going on at these universities. He, he doesn't is. read the news. But he is now. That's the wonderful and, thing. And yeah. Well, maybe when his publicist came to him and said, hey, they're calling you a Nazi. He was like, what? Me? And they're like, yeah, because you said these things. I was like, what? Oh, I bet he went because in early 2000s, his show Politically Incorrect was off the chain. Awesome. And then it got kicked. He got kicked off TV because he was too hot for TV telling the truth about the war well, machine. He, he said what, what he said, said the, that the, the, the guys not, that hijacked the planes were probably were not, not cowards because cowards, that was a, a brave thing to do to throw your life away for something you believe in. Was his no, argument. you can't say that. Yeah. Well, then what happens is you go into hibernation where it's like, I, I'm, I just got to pretend mm -hmm. like everything's fine. Fine. No, 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 and get no. By, he, he and then finally, you can't take it anymore. He got you older. Speak up. He 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 got older. He's not consuming this, the the up to date information on things. Like I'm not gonna be able to come here and tell you about the latest TikTok trend. I don't know. 
And in 10 years, when all of these young people who have built up big followings on TikTok are not talking politics, I'm not going to see what they're saying. Of course, me understanding that issue, I try to have a better connection to the, the generation's concerns in, in politi- the political arena, mm-hmm. of which right now as millennials, I'm entering, I'm, in, I'm entering, the, entering, I'm entering the end of my 30s. I'll be 37 in about two, uh, two weeks. 37. Happy birthday. So uh, for younger people, what do we do? Well, we 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 got you know you're you're, you're young-ish, it's I guess. Me, I'm Hannah a Claire. token female young person. There you go. We're bringing young people, <laughs> and we uh we 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 try to pay attention to what younger people are talking about. But there's a lot less younger people who care about politics, and that's the way it tends to be. When Bill Maher turned sixty, and millennials are now in their thirties, inheriting these systems and saying raising kids of their own, raising kids, having a perspective beyond just their own selfishness, or and seeing pers- what the schools yeah. are doing, seeing what they're teaching their kids. Mm-hmm. They're talking about it. Mm-hmm. You get Loudoun County. You get that fight. And Bill Maher, in his 60s, doesn't pay attention to these mediums, has no idea what's going on. And I'd be, I'd be willing to bet the only reason he became, he came to the position where he is now calling it out is because he kept getting notes from his publicist saying, you're a Nazi today, you're a white supremacist tomorrow. And Bill was probably like, what is this? What are you, what are they complaining about? Why am I getting negative press from all of these people? Then he gets half introduced to what everyone else is talking about. Now he's like, this is crazy. People are yelling at me for this stuff. If Bill Maher actually paid attention to a show like this or to the commentary we've had for the past several years, or even like the Lotus Eaters podcast with Carl Benjamin for a decade, he'd be well-versed on the modern culture wars. But it's not just that he doesn't pay attention. It's that I think this is true for most most, uh, uh, demographics, generations. They care about their peers. I don't pay attention to what Gen Xers are paying attention to. Uh, Bill Maher is a boomer, I think. I don't, yep. I, I yeah, don't I pay attention. I haven't seen Billie Eilish on his show yet. And Bill Maher. Not that he wouldn't have her. I don't know most that I, likely, I only know who that is because of my own kids. So there you go. Yeah. Bill Maher most likely cares about people in his yeah. surrounding demographic. Which is nice about what's happening is because it's like he, he emerged from the Matrix out of that tank of wet goo. And he's like pulling other people out of it with him like Brian Cranston. People that are like 65, 60 year old normies that are really influential are friends with Bill. So like he's kind of a tip of a spear for that generation. His new, um, I saw him and Cranston did an episode of his new show. Uh, what is it? Where they're just hanging out club, club random. random. Yeah. And they're like both like gently kind of acknowledging the culture war and like how yeah. crazy stuff is. As I an mean, aside, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be launching a new show. That's basically just, Sitting down and talking to people. That's great, dude. Do you have the, are you going to publicly announce the specifics? The dates, yeah, so the times, the, all that? I, I, we got to figure out when we're going to publish it. We're going to record it on Friday mornings because Friday mornings are just garbage news days. And most people, like the rate, like the views are way down. People mm-hmm. are a lot less interested. I know it sucks for people who like watching the news segments on Fridays, but it's just like journalists are all checked out. And I'm like, it's an opportunity to do a different show. So we have a guest coming this Friday, I believe. And it's not going to be, it's, it's going to be cultural. But it's not going to be like news topics I've ended like we do here, talking about current events. It's going to be just like open convo. What I love about the open convo is because that's how you in, envelop the spirit of the individual. Like that's the real com- the real conversation. Bring the humanity out of people. Like yep. we can talk about what happened and what might happen, but you really want to talk to someone about who they are. Mm-hmm. Man, that's when you see God. Yeah. So, so to clarify, I've had people say stuff like Tim Cast IRL. Tim's just trying to be like Joe Rogan, and I'm like. We pull up the top news stories of the day, and then I have a timer where we track news story segments, which is a combination of a, the guest's perspective and our perspective on current events. What this new show is probably be more like Rogan. It's literally just, or like Club Random. I'm going to sit down and be like, hey, what's up? This is who you are. Let's have a conversation. So it's like something we don't actually do in full. It's We're hard gonna- for me not to think that people who say, oh, this is like Joe Rogan don't really watch either one of those shows. They're right, obviously right, yeah. different as soon as you watch them. It'd be like saying like, oh, that crime show is like... Law and Order SVU, like Tucker Carlson Tucker is the exact Carlson's same as as Rachel Maddow. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. It's like, more like well, the view. I mean, get it straight. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> um, well, and I did want to say, sorry to cut you off. Oh. The only thing I was gonna say is, it, I just looked it up while we were talking, and Bill Maher doesn't have any children. So what you're saying, like the reason that you know who this pop singer is, is because you have children. Yeah. The people who keep you alert to what's going on in your school system, the people who you have to think, well, what's in their best interest? What mm-hmm. what are their concerns? Yep. You know, some people and I. If he didn't have kids, like I'm not going to speculate on why, 
But it is interesting that this coincides with the push, especially for young women, not to have children, to say why we got that crazy list, why, you know, 300 reasons why you should definitely not have children, they're bad, and even the good reasons are actually bad. You know, there is a push to keep people away from being connected to generations as well as to people within their own community. It's really sad. Dude, inter intergenerational co communication is so key. I love mm -hmm. internet video games for that reason, why yeah. I'm still tapped into, like, what a 14, how a 14-year-old thinks is, I mean, I don't, like, get down with 14 year olds intentionally I, but it's, it's fun to know it's it's so if, important if you play a game like if you play online video games on playstation you just oh man i i, I like playing human fall flat you ever play that game mm -mm. i've not played that one it's it's a silly game and you like you're a guy and you have you can like grab stuff and you climb up it's it's a weird control i don't know how to describe it you're just like a little dude trying to like climb obstacles and make it to the exit but don't turn on the audio because if you turn it on, all you'll hear is like 10 year olds going, ah, and I'm like, ah, okay. It's you know, people, if, man. if you want to figure out what the kids are up to, just play Call of Duty and then you'll get some 12 year old. I'm playing Hogwarts Legacy with my How, teenage son. Yeah, right I'm now. playing that now, but not that with my teenage that, son. That, I don't game's have one. In, that game's incredible. Oh, wow. Good game. I like yeah. it. Yeah, I want to well ask made. you about, we're going to go to Super Chats pretty soon. I want to ask you about your book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, because we've been talking about COVID, the, basically the government reactions to COVID. That's what this book's about. Correct. How do you, what is it about that that you saw that had in common with the Third Reich, which is Hitler's? organization, his Nazi organization. So a lot of people know about the Nuremberg trials that came out of World War II. But there was, an, there was another aspect of the Nuremberg trials. They held separate trials for what they described basically as a biomedical fascist state, that essentially the healthcare se sector had, had, had fused with the state to impose a lot of the experimentation um, uh, uh, and, and, and was categorized as healthcare policy. And so there was the, 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 the Hippocratic Oath um, the idea of human worth and dignity were totally lost via the healthcare sector. Uh, so there was there uh, that was the there was no more guardrails for anyone to go to for their humanity to get recognized once the state took it away. Were you going to say something there, Tim? I was, was going to ask you about. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about what we did with Japan when we brought. Uh, w w not 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 necessarily Japan. Didn't we bring over a bunch of their scientists? Oh, you're thinking of uh, we brought over a bunch of the German paper, scientists. Paperclip, but there yeah. was also something with the Japanese yeah. scientists. Because we, we learned a lot of information from Unit 731, Seven, just because right. they did the, things that we never would say right. were ethical to do, and they just took the information anyways, and then now we have all this. You know, I, I was going to say, I wonder if like war stuff, if you're talking about World War One, and that, I'm like, I'm wondering if that typically is their excuse for experimentation. Unit 731, that's the Japanese. Yeah, one. like, and paperclip. Mm -hmm. well, but that paperclip was mostly like what? Like physics and weapons and yes. stuff? Yes, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... What we saw here is the exact same thing. Obamacare basically ended what was left of the individual patient provider relationship on a corporate level in much of America. You can still find in people that are doctors that are independent. You can still go to a place like an integrative family health clinic in your area and, and not get sick care, but actual health care. But by and large, corporately, Obamacare ended the patient provider system. Uh, and you're no longer an individual. You're not treated. Any now we have, we've got guidelines from CDC. This is the code. CDC has the guidelines. Here's how we treat you. And all of that now was perfectly set up for when COVID came along. All, all of these ham-fisted po policies there is, that we didn't look at anything individual, didn't look at individual regions, because New York's hospitals are run over, Montana's schools have to be shut down, and on and on and on it went. And the fact that they they were the tip of the spear to impose all of this, they were that you were never allowed to question any of it. The science was against them from the very beginning. There were, and it, this wasn't a, a, a what, I think a lot of people thought that this was a, a, a substitute for the global warming debate. The, the, a bunch of right-wingers against scientific consensus wrong the reality is there were elite scientists from harvard yale stanford oxford number one rated university in the world according to u.s news and world report that pushed back against these things from the very beginning of the imperial college survey that shut the world down and yet they were all ignored they were ignored by the trump white house they were ignored by every every government in the world and we just went with this ham-fisted plan instead they never stepped back when the data showed they were wrong, they showed no humility, no empathy. We went, they, went, they violated 90 years of science en masse that we had developed since the Spanish flu post-World War I. We knew they didn't work against respiratory viruses. That's why you haven't been wearing masks every cold and flu season your entire life. They knew all of this, and yet they imposed this power instead. Why? We get into that in the book, and I think what really sets this book apart from other attempts that will be made to, to have a reckoning of this era. Okay. Go ahead. I was going to say, we, I, I want to make sure we point out 
they literally murdered people. Yes. That, that First of all, they created the virus, guys. They created the chimeric concoction that came out of that lab. The same people that were working on all the solutions, the same kind of elements within the NIH and, the, and our, it, that, it's not a China virus. I wish it were just their virus. Our scientists were over there working on this with them. How it, that's not even in dispute at this point in time. The big issue is how it got out of the lab and why. Okay. So, but in terms of the, the that's a good point too. We had the uh, there was a study or a, a, a paper from the University of Beijing. You, do you mention that in the book? Uh, I think it was University of Beijing. You want to you fact check me on this one? Where they said that bats had bitten and peed on people in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And that could be how the SARS-CoV-2 may have gotten out of the lab. Then, abruptly, it was rescinded and they said, nope, nope, we're wrong about that. But I didn't want to deviate. What I wanted to bring up was we can talk about mandates and lockdowns, but they literally killed people. And I want to just make sure yeah. we can be specific about this. They took COVID patients and put them in nursing homes Correct. with the most vulnerable population. In at least five states. In at least five states. And- why was a, tw- a 30 year old being put in a nursing home with elderly people who are at risk? Why were they not? What was it the comfort was the ship in New York? Yeah. You know, we can make up every argument in the world about why they decided not to use the Javits Center, why they did not decided not to put the, the ships that Trump sent in uh, to use those facilities and instead took people with covid who should not be in nursing homes and put them there. Yeah, so, you get, so, we, we get into the whole gamut. Every well, issue, real quick. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. you're right. The Beijing sponsored South China University uh, paper that said that instead of coming out of the seafood market, it was possible that someone had been had the blood of bat on their skin. And that <laughs> or had, I've been pissed one of the off. researchers had been attacked by a bat. So uh, he had quarantined for 28 days. Can, after can, that. I, can I address that really quick? Because the term gain of function gets thrown around a lot. And and, and don't get me wrong. Gain of function is is flirting with disaster, Molly Hatchet. Gain of function is 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 lighting up the Bikini Atoll with a, a hydrogen bomb to see what what what, it, what its blast radius is. That's not what they were doing. They were doing something worse. In their own words, they did ga- they did gain a function to gauge what they called quote spillover potential. These are their own words. That is now the akin of not we're not only going to drop a hydrogen bomb on the Bikini Atoll. We're now going to put a human being in the blast radius because we want to see what the radiation does to humans. They were specifically provoking these bat coronaviruses in the labs to spill over to human beings. They wanted to know. They were poking it, provoking it, prodding it. They specifically wanted to know what would make it spill over to a human being. That is, there's Icarus flying close to the sun, guys, and then there's Icarus flying up to the sun now, with a freaking hydrogen bomb and throwing it into the we, sun. We, That's what they were doing. We got to go to Super Chats, but I want to bring up one last thing. Did you know that in 2019 it was reported they were doing gain-of-function research on avian flu to specifically make it transmissible among mammals and, had it tra- and, and got the avian flu to infect ferrets? And the question is, now why would you go ahead and make something like that? The avian flu mortality rate is 60% when it, ju- it does cross over to humans, which mm-hmm. is rare because it's difficult for the virus to do. But why would you do gain of function to make it so it All the does. answers to that question are bad. Well, let's, uh, let's go to Super Chats. Well, yeah, we so, will, we'll finish we'll, that we'll, thought, though. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk about more of this okay. in the members. Let's go to Super Chats. Before uh, we do, make sure you smash that like button if you haven't already. Become a member at TimCast.com. Go to TimCast.com, click that Join Us button. We're going to have a pretty spicy members-only show coming up. Not so family-friendly. And uh, you can follow the show at TimCast.com. Follow me at TimCast. Let's read what you guys have to say. Falcon or Falcon or X says, huge fan of both Tim Pool and Steve Dace. Very cool. Appreciate Thank you. the support. All right. Brandon M says, the first act of the board of an organization without O'Keefe, whose name means truth, is to lie to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone, someone brought this up uh, last week or whatever. James O'Keefe is the only person accused of malfeasance by Veritas without, without evidence. Every single instance where Veritas has accused someone of doing something, they've shown the video of them doing it, hmm. except James. Yeah. That, now, how that'll stupid preach. stupid is that? They don't that. hold themselves to their own standards. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. Korek57 right. says, Tim, what do you think about Twitter personalities caught accepting PAC money from Biden admin? I don't know about that. What's that about? I don't know anything about it. No idea. All right. I don't know why the Biden administration would pay Twitter personalities to shill for them. Because I just think a lot of people would do it for nothing out of cultic devotion to the agenda, frankly. Totally. Yeah. But they yeah. pay all the TikTokers, you know, they got to get the young vote as well. There you go. They yeah. pay them to push a specific message, right? It's like right. a marketing deal. Right. Yeah. All right. What do we got here? 
Easy Kill says, here is my monthly donation that normally goes to Project Veritas. Use it well. Well, thank you for this. Mm. We need to, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with James O'Keefe. He is not an easy man to get in touch with right now. I imagine he's got NDAs or something, but I'd like to get in touch with him. And uh, so if he hears this, to, so we can try and figure out what he's going to do, because I'm sure whenever he has the chance, and I assume he can launch something quickly, we got to get him in here so he can tell all of you guys where to direct your donations to keep the work going. I don't think anybody's got faith in Veritas without a James O'Keefe. I don't. And I'm going to say it again. James putting out the music video Oligarchy is one of the reasons I liked Project Veritas. James doing the dancing and the DJ stuff, bringing this. Uh, I always talk about people got to throw pies, like throw figuratively, throw a pie, do something to build culture, to, to, to create something interesting. Project Veritas as these like, look, I, I, I don't want to disrespect the journalists who are doing these interviews, but like, I don't know who these people are. They're not charismatic. They, they mean, it means nothing to me. James is like this, this, this charismatic dude that I have, that I trust, shows strength and is interesting with the, the, like the character that he's developed for Veritas and the energy and the persona of Veritas itself. So I just want to say that again. I like the dance show. Well, oh, you got it. Nothing he did, you know, spending money on this music video or whatever else he's accused, accused of, like losing money wise the journalism kept getting bigger and better, yep. right? So if he spent $60,000 on a dance party, I mean, I think we've made it up in the amount of truth that he's uncovered, yes? Dad Cigarette Run says, watch the video on your channel and it's heartbreaking. There will be a reckoning. So uh, we an anonymous source provide some information to us pertaining to Veritas. So I just, it, there was a, it's a video of James O'Keefe basically explaining what's going on. Just uploaded it raw. And I was like, I don't know. Look, we're 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 planning on doing this new show, probably for probably recorded Friday. And I'm wondering if maybe we'll we'll upload the conversational podcast. It's going to be its own podcast on Apple and Spotify. Maybe I don't know Sunday nights. We're going to record it Friday morning, but I don't know if putting it up on Friday is the best thing to do. Maybe I don't know. Maybe a, we just do it. There's a lot of room on Saturday and Sunday for something. Well, Sundays are good days because people are at home and they're getting ready and you know. For the week, but yeah. yeah, and Friday's terrible. Like Friday night is yeah. just. Mm -hmm. But that's when I have the real opportunity to record it. And uh, I don't know. Maybe we just do it Friday morning. Yeah, that works. I'm always looking for content on Sundays, honestly. So yeah, I feel yeah. Like Sunday's yeah, yeah. a good day for release, but for your schedule, put it, it on. Sense well, to I'm thinking we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna record it ten to ten to noon on Fridays. Maybe we just upload it right away, right after the show. Hey, it goes up at right one on. on a Friday or something. It is what it is. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, I digress. Yeah. So uh, I, I I just put it up on the channel because I didn't know where else to put it. I was like, we want to publish it. We want people to see what James has to say. If anyone's following along, Veritas Twitter accounts lost twenty two thousand followers since we've been talking. So now it's at one hundred and fifty five. Yeah, one fifty seven five. I still follow them so so far. I mean, I want to see what they're saying. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, I'm I think it that's through, the hard man. thing. There are some people that want to be able to get the updates from Project Veritas. I wanted more companies like Veritas anyway, so maybe this is just the hard way to make that happen. I can't imagine Project Veritas without James O'Keefe. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I don't. I, I just, what are they going to? I don't know. I I have a feeling that James O'Keefe simply comes out and announces he's launching. You know, uh, the 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 truth operation. And instantly is making ten million dollars a year. Hires a staff, and the next video we see of a big expose comes from them and not Veritas. You know how there are some companies where one person does eighty-seven jobs, and when they leave, it's very difficult to replace them. Like, not only does James have this public persona, people send him information. He is involved in the administrative day to day. He's involved in his own reporting. Like, it would be so difficult to replace him, and it's easy for him to maintain. Uh, all of the skills that he has and just start something new. Yeah, Shout easily. Eric Spracklin. If you're well, listening. so, you know, I just got to say, James, you know, come on the show and then uh, figure out the new the new organization and we'll uh, we'll do a whole show. So as soon as he gets that ready, we'll, we'll have him here and we'll figure it out. Yeah, I guess what did they, they said, like he was packing up his stuff or something. Is that what they said in, the, in their yeah. statement? I imagine half the employees are going to leave and join his new company if he does that, I would imagine. Yeah. Probably a bunch of them would. I don't Ryan know. Ellis says the purpose of James getting the boot is to destroy Veritas. They don't care if they lose followers. They want it to crash and burn. Yeah, there you go. No. I just want to know why. Like, what is it? Oh, come on. Not your own I mean, organization. I mean, the Epstein stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. But like, 
I mean, the Epstein stuff, but like he's been going for a while, right? Like it's hard for me not to think that there is something that he wanted to do that the board was like, no, we're not willing to let that I happen. Think, no, 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 I think no, no, hold on, hold on. I think James the, got the, so no, freaked no, no, out because he was putting his life on the line and he's like, do what I say, no, no, do it. No, 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 like, no. I got, I got to stop you. The FBI raided the home of of James and his, and I guess he was in his underwear or something mm -hmm. and like other employees. This, this, they, they have been trying to shut down Veritas. It just seems they figured out how to do it. Maybe they went to a board member and said, you know what? Going after James isn't working. We'll go after you. And then the board members are like, I'm not dealing with this. Get James out of here. I'd rather not deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I whenever, whenever complete and utter stupidity is the, is the most benign and innocent explanation, rest assured, every other potential option is far worse than that. So this is either just mind-numbing stupidity that even if he is guilty of everything you're accusing him of, that you would choose now with the organization at its pinnacle of influence and success to absolutely kneecap and decapitate it. That, that, that you, that's either the, the issue. All these people just got this instantaneously stupid rather than handle this stuff privately or fill in the blank. Randall Hogan says, Tim, you need to hire James to run Timcast News. James O'Keefe does not need, I, I do not think he needs my help on anything, or I would also say, I don't know if I could afford to hire James O'Keefe. I mean, not, I heard he comes with a lot of legal fees. A lot of legal fees. <laughs> and his salary is publicly known, you know, because it's a nonprofit. They disclose what his salary is. But more importantly, James has the talent. Uh, work ethic and wherewithal to simply snap his fingers to create a new organization and with all the experiences gained probably get it up and running within less half a year and then instantly with his friends and allies in in the space have more than enough donors to be right back to where he was it may be a bump in the road but nobody needs to hire james james is probably just going to moonwalk his way into a new organization with a new name and it'll be bigger and better than ever i recommend a private for-profit corporation i don't think Anyone who donates to Veritas is concerned about how James is. It, 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 I'll, I'll, let me put it this way. James leaving, effectively ending Veritas, and everyone's like, the, he is Veritas. I'm willing to bet every person who has given James O'Keefe money, if James said to his donors, guys, my boat is broken and I work too much. The only way I can get it fixed is if I fly in a private charter. Here's how much we've brought in. Does anyone care if I spend 14000 on this? I bet... 98% or 100 would be like, James, you deserve this, man. The risks you've taken, the work you've done, mm -hmm. the, the positive impact you've had on society, take a private jet. If he had a for-profit company, nobody would bat an eye. They'd be like, well, it's his own company. He makes the money. He can do what he wants. But he does the right thing. Starts a nonprofit, takes a smaller salary than he, than he, than he would have if he was in a for-profit. And then now he's being accused of, and not to mention all stuff is lies. I just don't, I'm not going to believe it. Sorry. They said he was abusing employees. Then when that is disproven and the, and the donor, two donors come out and they're like, that never happened. Those are lies. Now it's, well, he was spending money. He wasn't supposed to spend. Yeah. Okay. Spare me. Anyway. All right. Matthew Emmons says, if only we knew someone who was starting a nonprofit that James could pivot to, if only it could be named Ministry of Truth. <laughs> uh, nice, nice. That's a good idea. That's very snarky. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Ministry of Truth. Uh, I think, I, I have to imagine right now, James is talking to like a corporate attorney about setting up a new nonprofit right now. The thing about nonprofits is you have to have board members. You have to. I know it's annoying. It's it's both the strength and the weakness of it because it, you can't start it without having three people in charge, which means two of them can throw you out at any moment if you're one of the three. You really got to trust the people you work with, have a vision for the future, and I don't know, just pray that the thing works. It's weird to think that you can spend three years building something and then your two managing partners can just decide you're out. I don't know if they, they can do it without just cause. I don't know if that works, but you know, it's so a lot of people are, are mentioning like I should hire James or start something with him, and I'm just kind of like. James needs to be the fa sole owner, CEO, 100% board member, all of that stuff of his own for-profit corporation. And then he can come on this show anytime he wants when he wants to shout it out and build up a membership base to help fund his work. And, and as I mentioned earlier in the show, he should do, he, uh, the, the legal fees are probably the, the most difficult thing for these guys. But he should do the normal work they're doing, 
and then offer a Project Veritas commentary behind the scenes for paying members. So sign up for 10, 20 bucks a month, support Veritas, for profit, not tax deductible. But then you can listen to James talk about the story in a more candid you know, fashion that he records like once a week or with every story. And I think that's the way to do it. Then he can spend the money on whatever he wants. Not that I think he's wasting it. And I think it just, it protects him. No, no board, nobody can fire him. Nobody can boot him. He never has to worry about this. Like, how did he get fired? He is Veritas. That's just insane to me. It should be possible. All right, all right. Because Reason says, James gave us an emotional speech. It makes me think while he is getting in his car and driving away, he ain't done yet. No way, he is a fighter. I mean, what if the next video we see of James is him just like sitting on the beach with like a coconut and he's just like, I'm done. I'm retired. I started I'm something. Out. I'm done. What if the first video of his new organization is of one of these board members? That's yes. what I was wondering. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. If Hell hath uh, uh, no fury like a muckraker <laughs> scorn, guys. I'll tell you Imagine that. being one of these board members right now, having to go into a meeting with Project Veritas, and they're going to be like, is anybody wearing the lapel mics? Anybody with the cameras? I, I, also would urge like every, <laughs> I would urge every member of that board, they're, if you, they're way too hot for you. Beware. Put it that yes. way. All right. All right. I, I have to imagine the only way the board can actually meet with Veritas employees right now is to make them all wear like unitards. <laughs> Everybody has to, here's your new uniform when you're in the building. Yes. <laughs> Someone's no, going to get them. It makes me wonder also, like they've been working with James for years. Like what does he already know about them that before he would have kept to himself that now he doesn't have to, right? Like unless they got him to sign a non-disparagement agreement, which I really doubt, they are completely vulnerable to him. He's got to start a nonprofit in West Virginia. He's got to come down here. Come down to West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not New York. New York's bad. Yeah, All right. New York's a terrible idea if you want to be a nonprofit, or at least a conservative nonprofit. All right, Rath says, Tim, AP News, roughly 30 minutes ago, so this is about 8, 8 p.m., Ohio metal plant up up in flames, yeah, several nice. people injured. Don't know if it's relevant. Wow. Yeah. Strons says, two dozen eggs cost me $12.48 today. 40 pounds of chicken feed, thirteen fifty. Blue sapphire chickens will be shipped tomorrow. Man. Twelve fifty. For is this the most expensive eggs have ever been in human history? <laughs> I don't know about. I think it is. I was looking at a chart of a chart of it over the weekend. But the thing is, I'm still seeing some egg prices that are relatively inexpensive. Like it's hard for me to history. say, right? I think in the last four decades from the chart I, think, I saw. Like, I don't know about human history. I'm I, four decades, maybe, but like during famine or whatever. You know, if you had a couple eggs, probably very expensive. But I think also more people had chickens, right? We. Yeah. During times of famine, Correct. people had their own livestock and ways of- Families, I think until what, like the 1900s, every family had a cow, mm -hmm. like at least one cow. Generally it was like a speaking. normal thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you had to go. Mm -hmm. But then you, you can't take it with stuff. you to your apartment in your, you know, yep. large city. So that went away. Man. And then we got too many eggs. Too many. Yeah. Because we got a chicken city. I was watching a documentary about the Middle Ages. They all had a pig. Not everybody, pretty much everybody had a pig. A and you'd have to turn yeah. them out onto the street at night. And they just root through. And there was just pigs all over the place. This is something that didn't get a lot of media attention. No. I think that people have a deep-seated hatred for pigs because of the way that the wild boars would hide in the bushes and ambush people, gore them, and then eat them alive. Oh, we and also so, we say they're like dirty. Yeah, we, like, we. I mean, there's such a hate. We don't have it for dogs. We don't. We don't call and eat dogs. We do it with pigs. They're just as smart, or essentially they're smarter. about. Yeah, but I think it's because of this deep-rooted hatred of the wild boar. So we're like, you know what? You've deserved this for hundreds of thousands of years. You've terrorized my species. Now we're going to eat you alive. How do you I like? I think it? they're just delicious you know they, like they certainly it, have it, become it could, that way it could possibly be that bacon happens to taste very good that's just it's, I'm, it's I'm, vicious I'm from Iowa, so you know i'm a fan of uh, i'm a fan of pig so yes yeah. i think pigs are very good i think yeah. i think uh, uh bacon is universally beloved yeah i've even had vegans tell me that you know the the, the activist vegans saying they miss bacon not yeah. all of them you know I'm not, I'm not trying to accuse all vegans of liking meat but the activist vegans have had people be like, yeah, yeah. That's why they buy fake bacon. Mm -hmm. the, the, the idea that vegan meat exists shows that these people are unhappy with their choices. <laughs> right. no, I'm, I'm, I'm just ragging on vegans now. No, you, you, you're all right, vegans. You can eat whatever you want. But I will point out that there's that famous video of when the hurricane was coming. And the whole store is cleared out, but the vegan section is completely full. Yeah. Like nobody wanted to buy any of that stuff. It's too salty, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Impossible Burger has more salt than a McDonald's Burger. McDonald's Burger's got too much salt in it as it is. I think when veganism got trendy, people thought it was code for healthy, and it's not. Like you can eat pasta with olive oil on it all day long and be a vegan and 
not be healthy at all. Yeah, sugar is vegan. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, Ore- Oreos yeah. are vegan. It's the overeating yeah. of meat and sugar that is what's the. It's the overeating. It's I not think the meat overeating itself. in general. Yeah. yeah, overeating in general of anything yeah. is bad. Although there is a lot of sugar in what we're eating now. Have you seen those videos about like back in the day people used to consume like half a pound of sugar? I should find the video and quote it more accurately. There's a funny advertisement when they were marketing sugar and it was like low calorie energy burst. And it was a woman yeah. eating a spoonful of sugar. It's wild. I've seen that And before. it was like for a low calorie burst of energy. And I'm like, that's the craziest idea. <laughs> yeah. like, don't do that. They had those sugar cubes. They'd be like, how many? One or two. And they'd put these giant cubes of sugar in the tea. Yeah, I think it's they, crazy. I'll I think they two. still do that. Oof. We this, have a we, in Iowa. We have a place called Living History Farms, where you can go back to the agrarian, more agrarian time in America, and you can actually do like theme dinners. And uh, one of the I went, my wife and I went uh, with some couples several years ago to what was dinner in Iowa was like for a family in like 1911 because this was 2011, so 100, you know, That's years so cool. Late. And it was, am- I could not believe, by the way, the amount of carbs they consumed. Mm-hmm. I could not believe the amount of calories they consumed. And absolutely, one of the palate cleansers in between meals was a thing of sugar cubes, mm-hmm. okay? And so, as, a, as someone who, over the years, had, has lost like over 100 pounds, like I'm like really cognizant of the amount of food there, there that, that I get served now, you know? And, and I remember asking the attendant, how did... All these people ate this much food, and yet, man, like size 36 jeans would have been considered chubby to them, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like I had to lose 100 pounds to fit into a size 36 jean. And she said to me, well, they also worked out in the fields for nine hours a day and and burned all those calories off. Their jobs weren't sedentary, okay? There was this study that came out that said that uh, our average body temperature has gone down by a degree because we are less active Mm -hmm. as Mm -hmm. a whole, right? That more employment is sedentary, so you spend more time sitting. Like Mm -hmm. We are seeing the effects of the shifts in our economic lifestyle. Like, I don't necessarily want to work in a field. I, I mean, I'm so that's why you saw Michael have. Phelps is, is, you, when have, he was swimming was doing 5,000 ca- per, <laughs> per, per, per meal. Like 8,000 yeah. calories per day or something. Yeah. I, uh, when I was skating at my max, I was probably doing five to 8,000 calories a day. And a mm-hmm. lot of people don't believe me, but I'm like, no, like seriously, like whole pizzas to myself. Yeah. Skating for like eight to 10 hours a day, drenched in sweat. Yeah. All day nonstop, like yeah, it was brutal. I dated eat this girl crazy. who ran marathons, and she we would eat giant pasta. She'd make giant pasta meals and then eat it, and then just be super thin like a. Re- and I'm like, I couldn't eat, I couldn't, couldn't do it, dude. Couldn't I would, I would wake up in the morning and we'd go grab like some fast food. I get like two burgers, two nuggets. We would go skate like crazy. Then I would get like a a, a Panda Express three entree meal. Mm-hmm. Then we would mm-hmm. go back and at night have like a whole pizza. It's like I would go to the skate park and skate for eight to ten hours. Just nonstop drenched in sweat. The next day, I wouldn't be able to walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, like I would just be paralyzed from like my muscles just tightening up, and I couldn't move. Yeah, yeah, I knew. I know. I have a family friend whose sons are both very elite baseball players. One plays in college. One plays in high school. And she used to tell me that, especially when they were going through puberty, and both of these guys are like six foot five, six foot seven. They're huge. She used to just like get pounds of ground turkey and like keep it like cook it for them and they would just eat it all the time because they were constantly hungry one of them went to boarding school and you know he, so there's a uh, cafeteria a dining hall and he didn't have access to food all the time and he lost like 30 pounds because he wow. was just this huge athlete who needed calories i mean that's the closest we have to this time period mm-hmm. that you're talking about when they were uh, there's much more physical labor also you walked more places to get around like yeah. transportation people, pe- people also don't also really underestimate how many ca- how much calories they are eating like when they started adding the cal- adding the cal- calorie counter to like menus and stuff at a fast food restaurant, and you're like, you mean a burger and fries is fifteen hundred cal? Mm-hmm. What the? Yeah. Yep. So imagine yeah. if you did it three times a day, you had five thousand calories. Yeah. Crazy. Does yep. do people? Or, you know, forty five hundred. Do different people produce different amounts of calories from the same food? Like if you eat a piece of broccoli, I eat the exact same piece. Would would one of our bodies make more heat? Yes. So then, so it's the calorie what, number's not in the food. It's it's a result of our body cal- burning ca- the food. Calorie is a representation of uh, energy required to, to burn or something like that. But burn the food or burn right. the But, my, but the, the issue is, uh, it, uh, to clarify what your question is, if you take the same piece of food and two people, like a, exact replicas and two people eat it, their bodies will handle it differently. And there is no way it could be equal in the energy output. Yeah. So that's why I, the calorie is not in the food. That's that's important to keep in mind. Not super important. Someone who is six foot five, 220 pounds muscle is given a cupcake. Someone who is 90 pound, a 90 pound female who doesn't exercise is given the same cup, the same exact cupcake. The, the body is going to use them in very different ways. Like the, the output will probably be very different. So 
Like, and, and actually, a better example might be like uh, a steak, where you've got a lot of protein. The body's got to break down very hard in the liver and some or something like that. A dude is going to probably rip through that thing way better than someone who's not working out or sedentary. So you, you not, not not only that, but I mean like. Somebody who's morbidly obese and doesn't exercise, who get, who's given a cupcake, is going to have a blood sugar spike and mm-hmm. probably feel really, really sick. An athlete will probably just not even notice. Probably maybe feel sick later. I mean, bad food is bad. You know, garbage in, garbage out. Anyway. All right. Let's read some more of these Super Chats. OMG Puppies says, Jehovah's Witnesses and Adventists believe the earth will be restored to the Garden of Eden and the saved will live there. The 144,000 are a special group who go to heaven. So there you go. They want you to live in the Garden of Eden. You can't go to heaven, though. Sorry, it's not for you. All right. I, I prefer the biblical worldview where Jesus offers all of his followers heaven, not just 144,000. How did they get to that number? I don't understand. It's a symbolic number in the book of Revelation. Ah. All right, what do we got? Ted Mahoney says national divorce would reduce the remaining states to global insignificance, and we would be dissected and ruled by other superpowers. Agreed. Yep. Mark Guidetti says real Americans want to fix the union, not run away from it like cowards. But that would require federal intervention into California, which probably would result in, I don't know, civil war unless California rolls over. But so long as California is violating the Constitution and subverting the federal government, what more can we do? The social compact is dead. There is no social compact in America anymore. And... And that, that really is the, the, the underlying foundation of a constitution. What a constitution does is it, is it codifies that social compact. It, 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 it takes the shared values and itemizes them and enumerates them in a legal document. The social compact is the essence of what a constitution enumerates, and that is gone. And, and so California has no problems whatsoever um, about a, about being a platform to eradicate your way of life. In fact, it is proud of doing so, and it is affirmatively. It's not. It's it's not an accident. It's 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 missional. They're doing it on purpose. the The only way you're going to hold the union together, outside of civil war, or revival, is you're going to have to have more governors do what DeSantis has done in Florida, mi- militant forms of federalism and interposition. Uh, the, the doctrine of interposition, or of the lesser magistrate, that's what the founders wanted state and local governments to do, is, is, is the people you elected on a state and local level, juries were a form of interposition. They called them the fourth branch of government. Um, that, so right down to, to 12 peers on a local jury, you could interpose. If Washington, if the federal government went off the rails, these other layers could stand in and say, no, you don't get to impose that upon my people. We won't enforce that here. We will not impose that on them here. We won't adjudicate that here. We will practice, uh, through the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, forms of interposition. You have to, and, and they've done that to us. When Donald Trump got elected in 2000, when, John, when Donald Trump took office in January of 2017, there were fewer elected Democrats in office in America than there had been since before the Great Depression, before FDR's New Deal created the modern Democratic coalition. And yet, did, did San Francisco say, ah, oh, snap, Republicans have total control of, of the White House and uh, Orange Man Bad as president. We're going to stop doing subsidies for trans homeless people in San Francisco now because the, the other sides, and did they change, San Francisco change anything they were doing? No, they just San francisco on. That's an example of interposition. That's a good they, verb. They just kept on San Francisco and didn't care what the hell Orange Man Bad was saying from the White House. Can we can we just write it San Francisco? So for, San Francisco <laughs> on. That, that should that that's the verb for doing you know failed policy. Yes, insane thing. What, what, we, need, what we, we need what we need West Virginia, in. your state, where not a, a Democrat <laughs> hasn't won your pre a precinct in your state since the 08 presidential election. Yeah, Manchin's going to switch parties. But but we need West Virginia to be as red as California is blue. It's not. My state of Iowa is redder than yours. Mm-hmm. Texas needs well, to Texas needs to be redder than Florida. Well, Mississippi. Look at Wyoming. But, but, but do you know how close West Virginia is to D.C.? Well, I understand. And and you got Frederick, and then you've got the college towns, and you've got. What but you, you're still what, in a state where Democrats haven't won in a presidential election a precinct since 2000. Not a county, right. a friggin' precinct. 
We need. It, but Iowa is historically red, right? No, and West Virginia's not. No, until uh, Bush in two thousand four. Uh, was the only Republican since Reagan 84 that won our state in a presidential election until Trump. Mm. It w- it's traditionally been a very purple state. We need Mississippi, Alabama, those states need to actually earn their reputations. The red states are not as red as the hard blue states are blue, and that's what's killing us more than anything else. If we had more interposition, more of essentially um, de-escalating what they try to do to us from Washington, that would give us much more of a chance than what we have right now. All right. Avel says, I have never heard of Steve before tonight's show, but he has a new follower. Also, Hannah, Claire, and Ian look like they could be related to just an opinion. Oh, they actually are. Yeah. Yep. Long lost uh, cousins. <clears throat> Thanks well, for thank reuniting. You're just generalizing white people right now. I don't like that. You guys all look the same. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, I, am I allowed, and under the rules of wokeness, am I allowed? Like how much of a, not, of a how much not white do you have to be before, you know, I, I think Serge is because he's African-American. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a technicality. Your mic's hey, off. Your mic's off. Yeah. yeah, I let it say off. People told me I should oh. stop talking. But yeah, it's a technicality. <laughs> but hey, what do you mean? Literally, you're yeah. South yeah. African. I mean, uh, literally, I am African-American. So. Didn't, didn't Shouldn't you Elon be proud Musk, of who you are? I don't understand what's happening. Did Elon, Elon, Elon Musk say something about that, like being an African-American? Someone said it about him, like they're, they're yeah. being mean to like the African-American tech entrepreneur, Elon Musk. There's, a, a, uh, there's like a famous story where there was a grant for African-American scholarship or something. And a blonde haired white kid showed up and yeah. they were like, what is this? And he's so like, funny. I'm from South Africa. No, but I guess like he genuinely didn't know. Yeah. He, Cause he was like, we don't have that phrase mm-hmm. where I come from. So it said African-American. And I was like, oh, I'm from Africa. And I came here and then they got mad at me. Like, never, was, never made sense to me actually. It was just this. Yeah. Like Caucasian from the Caucasus region. The best That's is. That's not where I'm from. I'm not from there. The best is when I was in university, I went to school with a guy from uh, Britain who is from Jamaica. His mother's from like St. Lucia. And everyone called him African-American. Like, I'm not American. Yeah. Like, don't, what are you what are you saying? Like I I knew a guy who was uh not an American citizen and uh this is a long time ago at a different job I had and uh we were talking about Caucasian, African American, Pacific Islander, what do these things mean? And then this guy got really mad, he's like, I am not African American, I am from Haiti. Yeah. And he was like, he wasn't even an American citizen. You know, he had like a work visa and he was Haitian and he was like, Call me Haitian, man. Yeah, seriously. Just calling him African. Anyway, all right, let's see what we got here. Thomas Sidebottom says, I hate the argument I usually get from lefties that religion, Christianity, is a cult. Cults remove you from your family and support structure. Christianity helps you develop a better bond with them. Right. That's a, that's a really good distinction. A, a key component of cults is to isolate you from family and, and friends to, to keep you away from anyone who might oppose what they think. Whereas not even just Christianity, but a lot of these are very internally family oriented, mm-hmm. like Judaism, for instance, with, with uh, uh, Shabbat. It's like, be with your family. Mm-hmm. Talk to those you love and care about. So, I Well, the, the, the cult of the spirit of the age is doing that now. It's just doing it in, in terms of uh, the, you are separated from your family into the new woke religion. And you, you should separate yourself from anybody that might have different viewpoints rather than debate them, discuss with them, or even try to defeat them in the arena of ideas. They're automatically a lesser form of human, racist, misogynist, xenophobic, homophobic, right. bigot. So they're, they're the other and, and should not be uh, considered for uh, polite viewing or for debate whatsoever. We are going to head over to, uh, we're going to go record the members only show. So go to timcast.com and sign up. Click that join us button because we're going to talk about the rise of the Fourth Reich and biomedical tyranny and a lot of stuff like that. It's going to be really interesting. So again, smash that like button, subscribe to the show, share the show with your friends, and become a member at TimCast.com. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Steve, do you want to shout anything out? You've got great hardwood floors downstairs, man. Really? I'm really impressed. Yeah. Some of the nicest hardwood floors I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. I didn't was, think they were that good. I mean, we, we haven't got really a nice. Hmm. Yeah, I was really impressed. Wait till see the new. Wait till you see the new studio. We uh, we we filmed a music video there, at the new space, and it's like it's getting there. It's it's getting there. The studio room is mostly done. We could probably start setting up studio equipment there now. Yeah, probably. Because the room itself is, I think, is done, and the green room is getting work done. I'm really excited. We should need to get it done asap. But yeah, thank you for shouting out the hardwood you bet. floors. And you can, if you want, if you liked what I had to say here tonight, uh, sign up for the podcast. Just look for Steve Day Show on iTunes. Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon, all that stuff. Right on. Uh, I'm Hannah Claire Rimbo. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. Steve, this has been great. Uh, you should follow at TimCast News on Twitter and on Instagram. It's the best news site, in my opinion. Uh, you can follow me personally 
on Instagram at hannahclaire.b and you can follow me on Twitter at hcbrimlow. Also, if you know where I can get more knit uh, American flag sweaters, I'd like to add some more to my collection. That would be cool. But they have to be knit, not just printed. Thank you. Have a good night. Everyone, Ian Crossland, iancrossland.net. Follow me anywhere online at Ian Crossland. Happy to be here, Steve. Good to see you. You bet. Just to shout it out again, man, Nefarious, your movie's coming out. April 14th, whoisnefarious.com. All right. And uh, Rise of the Fourth Reich, your book. We'll be talking about that later tonight. All right, man. We'll have that up in about an hour. And I am at surge.com on Twitter. Talk to me there. And we're also uh, exploring doing the members only segments live immediately following the show. So we just got to work out the, the the workflow to get it going. But for today, we'll just record it. And then maybe within this week or next week, we'll figure out how to do it live if we can. So anyway, we'll see you all over at TimCast.com on the homepage. In about one hour, you will see the uncensored members only. We'll see you there. Thanks for hanging out. Cheers.